you are alive. Well, how is this for a way to start the Sunrise Safari here on Juma and Arethusa Private Game Reserves? We are in for a treat weather-wise, that's for sure. It's going to be a beautiful day here. And that is the direction we plan on heading in, straight east, straight towards the sun in that same direction. I've just heard lions roaring. Now, hard to tell how far away they are, but we are going to go there and investigate, and you are going to be joining in on this adventure. It's live, unscripted, unedited. We do not know what is going to happen, when or how, and that is the joy of being on safari. My name is Scott, and I'm teamed up with Dave on camera. James is headed out on the other vehicle with Jean Dre, and we are both going to be heading into the general direction of east and north, towards our northeastern corner of Juma, where last night we had four of the Inkuhuma lioness. We're not too sure where they would have gone, but there certainly are a lion calling out in that direction. So let's go and see what's happening. If any of you are joining for the first time, I was just imagining things. But let's actually just take a quick look. The clouds are going uh, beautiful pink color, especially the few that are just above the horizon there. So we'll take a quick look at those, and then we'll head off. And while we take a quick, quick look at those pink slithers, I can let all the new viewers know that we'd love to hear from you, and it's very easy to communicate with us. Look at that. And in order to chat to us, you can simply use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or send an email through to questions at wildearth.tv. Wunderbar. For the new viewers, uh, something I can quickly point out, part of our team is the Juma Watsall camera, which is a little camera that's just situated up here on the right of this tree. Morning, everyone. Hello. It could well be p people watching both feeds. One from that live waterhole camera. Oh. You wouldn't believe it, but let's try and see if we can get this bird, Dave. This is a giant kingfisher. It's making a real racket. Off it goes there. Great work. Look at how big it is. It's like a kookaburra. For any of the Australian viewers who may be with us, that is a very, very big kingfisher that we haven't seen for a long time. I don't know what it's doing here because there's no fish to eat, so it's a confused kingfisher. But what a bonus. We just did a quick flyby and very distinctive call that I was extremely surprised to hear. Bonus, that could well be a new bird for a lot of your bird lists. Mike in Florida, if you're out there, Please let us know, because yesterday, or also let us know if you tuned in to the Sunset Safari yesterday, because we saw a black crown night heron, which is a bird that I'm fairly certain is not on your bird list. I'll be surprised if it is. I know the first sighting I've had of one since being here at Juma was yesterday. Okay, well, we're going to be moving quite quickly in the direction of that line audio. I've got a feeling like it could be outside of Juma, but certainly worth going to investigate. It can be difficult to be certain exactly, at least for me, where lions are calling, unless they're very close by. So while we bump along these bouncy roads, we are going to send you across to Mr. Henry for an update on his exact plans. and welcome to the northern boundary of Juma Private Game Reserve, where I am heading in a due easterly direction, as evidenced by the pinkness of the horizon up ahead. My name is James Henry, and on camera today we have Jean Dre. Hello, Jean Dre. Hello. Jean Dre is, um, well, he's very brown after a prolonged sojourn in uh, the Antipodes. Not so, Jean Dre? Yes, very nice. Excellent. Okay. Uh, our plan this morning is roughly the same as Scott's. We're going to drive along to the east and see if we can't pick up on the lions that were calling earlier. I did hear some other lions calling, uh, roughly probably from the Indian Ocean. They were so far away. I think we'd run out of fuel if we tried to find them. 
but I'm hoping the ones that Scott heard are a little bit closer by than that. Now, as with Scott, we are as live as he is, of course, and therefore, please, will you talk to us on Twitter, hashtag Safari Live, or questions at wildearth.tv on the email. Also, the YouTube chat is a good way of talking with us as we drive along. The other reason I've come along the northern boundary here is to see if we can find, perhaps, the wild dogs that were around yesterday, and it would be marvelous if they came trotting across the boundary here, and then we can follow them as they go on their dawn hunt. They are hunters, voracious hunters of the reserved antelope species, and I think that on a day like today, perfect conditions for them to be hunting. And so we'll just keep an eye out for them and a listen, which reminds me, I'm just turn the radio up. Uh, listen to the radio. Here they go. Nick in Reno, a nice question from you about why it is that we're only sort of active during crepuscular times. And the reason is that, as you say, the animals are far more active during this time of the day than they are in the middle of the day. Uh, yes, it does vary seasonally. Certainly in winter, when it's not quite as hot as it is now, uh, they will be more active during the middle of the day. And if we come on safari, it's often quite a nice thing to spend the day out rather than, you know, the chilly early morning or the chilly evenings. But um, this is the time when animals are most active. An hour or so before dawn, going into dawn and then after, and then an hour or so going into the evening and an hour or so after dark. It tends to be the times when the animals are the most active, especially the predators. And everybody, of course, likes to see the predators. Nice one. Thank you, Nate, for that in Reno. It is a lovely, lovely morning, very fresh smelling. And it's the first kind of morning we've had a bit of dew for the last little while. It's been cloudy up until recently. And so while it's quite chilly this morning, you can see I've donned a jacket. It will be very hot later on today. Apparently, we're going to push up towards 33 or 34 degrees Celsius. Uh, it might go up as high as 38 sometime during the course of the week. And that's pushing 100 Fahrenheit, which I think is quite warm. You said Crepuscular Times is quite a good title for a novel. Uh, I agree with you, Percy. Maybe I shall write one one day called Crepuscular Times. John Ray, do you want to write a novel called... You want that title? No, I'll give you the honor. Okay, thank you. John Ray, very kindly says I may use it. Thank you, Felicity. Crepuscular Times. It's actually a really good idea, I think. <laughs> Nothing happening yet on the boundary. But that pinking sky is very beautiful indeed. Ah, Gabby Schmidt, you want to know who's in the control room this morning? Well, we have Luisi on the on the vocals today. That means that she is talking to us, relaying your questions, and uh, telling us what's going on in the other vehicle, giving us updates. She's watching the. She's basically watching the vision mix. Uh, she's swapping between the feeds. So if I say something nasty, she'll just cut me off. Likewise for Scott. And then I think uh, it's Kirsten on the keys today. So that means that she is reading the Twitter and email feeds, feeding through the relevant questions to what we're seeing. So sometimes if you ask a question and it isn't answered, it's because it's come through sort of after we've been looking at whatever it is you've asked about. So don't be distressed if your question isn't answered absolutely immediately. So those are the two of them there. I think Leanne is having a snooze in this morning. I'm not sure. And of course, Nic Nicola, who is often in the final control, is in fact sitting on the back of Scott's vehicle as we speak. This is because they don't often get to go out in the early dawn light, and that's what she's doing. It is a truly spectacular morning. The last few, like I say, have been overlaid with cloud. And what we're going to do is get to the top of the hill here and just have a little bit of a listen. To see if we can hear lions or alarm calling birds.
hear the odd cricket. I can hear a ground scraper thrush calling. I can hear an oriole in the distance. Some Franklins, some doves. And it is a slightly more exuberant dawn chorus than we've had in the past or that we've had lately. Remember, we've had very quiet dawn choruses of late. Just simply because there has been no water. And therefore the birds have had not much to eat. They haven't been breeding nearly as much. And the sun is going to pop up any minute now. OK, on we go. But no roaring of lions, no yelping of wild dogs. say you've been living in cities all your life and you wonder how sort of our perspective of life living in the bush is different from yours. Sandblaster, um, both of us actually grew up in cities. Well, I certainly more than Scott. And so there's a very, uh, you know, I can sympathize with you living in a city. I just think that living out here does touch us something for me that um, I don't get in the city. And I remember moving back to the city uh, for a while after I was in the bush and constantly looking for little pieces of nature, we had pieces of grass that had managed to come through the cracks in the pavements, for example. I always thought that that was a wonderful example of how nature is all around us, even if we try to shut her out. Let's head across to Scott before we go through this dip where I will lose signal and I will see you the other side. Sandblaster. Interesting question you've asked. I also grew up in a city, um, but was fortunate enough to have my parents take me through to the bush uh, many, many times growing up. So I got these little tastes of what it was like to be in wild, open places, uh, filled with little bugs and insects. That was my main kind of passion initially. I guess maybe that's because of what I could get close to. But there certainly is something about, for me, the freedom of being out in the bush like this, as well, of course, the animals. Huh. I've seen a feather float down and hit the ground. And I'm wondering what bird it's from. I'm going to keep an eye on the feather. I'm just going to check if we can't find the bird. There's only one tree to our left that it could have possibly floats it down from. It would be nice to know what bird the feather is from. But as we look up into that redwood tree, I cannot see the bird anywhere. Look at those clouds! Woo! And as I jump out to go and grab that feather, well, actually, let me finish Sandblaster's question first. Um, I'll then jump out and grab the feather. But you can take a tour of those bright pink clouds while we wait. See, so, yeah, I guess one of the main things for me, Sandblaster, is the freedom of open places, of, uh, of, of the bush that I love, and the fact that you're not really spoon-fed the chaos and confusion and quite often terrible media that you get surrounded by in cities. So I enjoy being able to escape from those harsh realities of the world we live in. The people I've also got to know in the bush, not just the animals and the beautiful places, but generally the people that I've met out here, I guess are like-minded, similar souls that also seek the solitude and peacefulness of wilderness areas. And they really do, well, I really have formed some wonderful friendships and bonds with various people that I've worked with, not only the people who you would probably typically be friends with in a city, um, but a lot of strange uh, characters that you would ordinarily never mix with if, if you lived in a city. It's one of the joys of working in the bush is that you have an entire working uh, contingent or team from the lowest uh, uh, kind of junior staff up to the general managers and, and, and the staff above you and your bosses. And what it means is that you live and play and work and sleep and eat and do everything with this wide mix of people that you ordinarily wouldn't do uh, in the cities. You 
in a city job, you kind of you're not probably going to speak to uh, the junior staff that much after work because you go home after work. Whereas in the bush, like I say, you eat, sleep, work, drink, and really get to know everyone in in a workforce very well. And I really love that the fact that you get to meet people and interact with people of all different genres. Okay, the feather. Where is it? It literally just floated down as we drove and then landed where I picked it up. So I don't know where it could have come from, unless a bird flew over a few moments before we got you. I'm not even going to hazard a guess as to what it is. But very, very pretty little feather. If any of you have ideas of what this may have come from, please feel free to shout. But I just can't, like I said, begin to even guess what bird this is from. Not a starling. Not a Woodlands Kingfisher, that I can tell you. Other than that, though, I'm not too sure. Thanks, Dave. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it into my wig. My wig's quite thick, so it generally receives feathers quite well. There we go. And this shall be our good luck charm until it falls out. Oh, is it even there? Yeah. It's getting lost in my wig. Hmm. Oh, completely gone. Anyway, that's, that's how it's going to be. The lost lucky charm. And Sam Blasi, you've just mentioned that you've never seen a feather floating down and hitting the ground in New York. I guess already a little tease from Mother Nature showcasing how lucky we are out here. But what, what, I, what I would suggest doing, Sam Blaster, is um, I have been to New York once. I don't remember seeing flying rats, a.k.a. the feral pigeons there, but they must be there, no doubt. It was winter when I was there in New York. It was freezing. Um, yeah, phew, I remember just shivering. Like, I could, could not believe possible. This was after coming from Aspen Sand Blaster, which is a cold, snowy place, but I found the wind getting channeled down those streets in New York was quite frigid. Anyway, the flying rats, a.k.a. feral pigeons of New York, I'm sure you could do a simulated kind of event there, and if you took some food out and created some chaos and confusion, I'm sure one of their feathers would fall out and float down and not touch the open earth, but it would hit the, hit the curb, but you would get to see that feather floating down. And that's something that I, I, I said the other day. Um, of course, it's not the same as being in a wilderness area, but the fact that wilderness does surround us, uh, doesn't matter where you are, is something worth remembering. And sometimes, I guess, it maybe just takes a little bit more exploring and efforts to find some little interesting critters. They don't necessarily need to be big. But there can be, like I say, some interesting things to observe. Just about it. anywhere you live, I guess. Obviously, big cities are going to have to start thinking out of the box, but it is possible. Hey, Marilyn. Very happy to hear that the giant kingfisher is an extra bird for you. And you are up into 130 birds. So charging forward that's a good number to be on and for those of you who are only starting out your bird list today like right now um marilyn also started there on one and now she's on 130 so you too can catch up to her and mike in florida who is currently leading the bird list challenge is on 240 something I think. Lucy, 
Lucy in Indiana, you're up to 179, so nearly at the 200 mark. That's good going. Got to have to try and make the most of the migratory birds while they're still here, everyone. Um, I'm not sure if there's any migrants that we're missing off the list, but we've been doing okay so far. I guess a lot will depend on which drives you've been on, because we obviously don't know when some people are with us or when they are not. Hi, Jeff, in Texas. You say that this feather could possibly be from a hawk, a bird of prey of some sorts. Yes, I agree. Quite hawk-like. Quite a few brownie-colored birds of prey here, so that's feasible. Another one that's come through is that it could be a Franklin. And yes, could one of these critters right here. Here's a crested Franklin. Have any of you lost a feather recently? Oh, look at those feathers. That would be a nice one to jam into my wig. Those wing feathers. What's for breakfast? Hmm, something very small. We can't see. Okay. Well, this is a kind of, what size is this bird? This is almost like a feral pigeon, slightly bigger than a feral pigeon, I'd say the flying rats that I was talking about earlier to give you a description. Obviously you can see from its oh, anatomy and its incredible speed that it is a chicken-like bird that spends a lot of time on the ground. We're gonna continue on, we're getting closer towards where those lions were calling. And as we move into this area, we are going to be sending you across to James, who's somewhere on our left also heading in this area. We'll probably be uh, bump into you guys shortly, actually. Okay, see you later. We just thought we'd stop here at the northeastern corner of Juma and show you the sun, which has popped up, of course, originally over the Indian Ocean, and now it's flowing into South Africa, golden light from what is a magnificent dawn. We haven't had a good dawn like this for the last little while. And while it is the harbinger of a sweaty day to follow, it is marvelous to look at. Is it not, Rondre? Quite so. Are you inspired by your first low felt sun sunrise? Uh, tremendously. Good, tremendously. In Siberia, Zumi, you want to know how much do the, do the sounds and the serenity of the wild out here affect me during the day or affect us during the day? Well, I cannot speak for someone like Jean Dre, but um, for myself, Siberia, it affects me profoundly. It's the whole reason I live out here. And for me, the animals that we see are very much a magnificent bonus to the advantages of living in a place where I can hear nature all the time and I can, can absorb it. And that's why I've stopped up here now. Oh, I mean, hopefully we're going to hear the lions calling, but we haven't heard them as yet. But Siberia, the sounds affect me very deeply and the sense and the atmosphere of a wild place like this, yeah, I mean, that's the whole reason we live out here, really. And I suspect for many people it's half the reason they watch the show is to have some kind of a touch of the wild, which of course is a deep need in all of us. Anyway, I've heard no further sign of those lions. I am not sure which lions Scott heard, but the lions are certainly the ones that I heard are a very, very long way from where we're sitting right now. I thought that they were deep inside the Kruger Park, not quite in the Indian Ocean, but the, almost that far east. OK, I think we're going to head south now. I'm almost tempted to just turn around and do this cut line back again, just in case the dogs don't come across here, but I don't think we'll do that. Let's try and find out where those lions went first, and then we'll head back towards Sydney's and see if the dogs don't pop out there. There are a few people moving about on um, Biffles Hook, which is to the north of us here. And that's where the dogs were seen yesterday. So maybe they'll pop out sometime during the course of the morning. I'm sure they will. Okay, here we go. A 
that sky is just too spectacular. Mm. And thank you, everybody, for your comments on the sunrise. Of course, Jandre and I had nothing to do with it, but it is very magnificent indeed just to spend some time looking at a sunrise like that. I now can't see anything, of course, because I've been staring at the golden orb coming up. I'm just seeing spots, so I wonder if I run over a line, you will tell me, will you? I'll consider it. I will just pay quite close attention now here to the road for the tracks. Gabby, it is a very interesting question from you why we drive along hoping to find some lion tracks or some dog tracks. You want to know about local languages and being a guide here, do you have to learn a local language? No, you don't have to. Most people speak a basic form of English out here. Um, I just think it's A, respectful to learn a language if you can or a form of it. And B, I think it's particularly good for your brain, actually. To, many studies show that it's amazingly good for your brain to learn a local language or learn a different language. Um, it does, connects all sorts of things in your brain. And so there are two very good reasons for learning a local language. And I think just to make an effort in a local language makes a big difference, especially in South Africa, where we have a obviously conflicted history. not very well, but they do speak English. I'm not going to look at you in the eye, I'm just going to stare at the sun as we drive along. But then vocalizing before you say, well, the meaning of the, their calls is to basically G each other up, to get each other going. First of all, that's what they were doing there. They were just kind of encouraging each other almost. And then they do it also to... kind of like a bark sometimes and sometimes like a woo woo. The hyena, to me, let out the most amazing sound. It let out an absolutely terrifying sound. Real primal growl. And it um, curdled, curdled me blood, it did. And it seemed to eventually put the wild dogs off. I do hope I haven't missed any tracks going across the cheetah cut line, not the cheetah cut line, the, um, the Biffles hook cut line, but I don't think I have. But if Scott hasn't found anywhere he is, then I'm interested to know where they could be. So just to give you a bit of orientation, we're on the eastern boundary now. We came along the northern boundary. The lines could have crossed north. I don't think I saw any, well, I didn't see any tracks, but I may need to go and check again. The Biffles hook dam where they were seen last night is just in here. You can see a slight depression of valley down through there, and that's where Biffles hook dam is. So we'll just drive very slowly along here and see if the tracks don't cross out. There's a quite a nice picture. You're actually with Scott now. Well, you are. He probably doesn't know that. I think it's quite funny. But you are with us. That was a kuni running across the road between us. And there you can see us waving at you. Now, hang on. There's some kudu jumping across the road. Let's just turn off and have a listen. We'll roll down the road here. Don't see any sign of those lions. Well, that was quite fun, wasn't it? We don't often do that sort of thing. I hope Scott wasn't taken by surprise. Of course, all of the weird behaviour that the presenters and cameramen engage in during the during the course of a drive are could be exposed. Getting an update from Andrew. No, nothing happening there. 
Well, there are some elephant tracks here. But I can't see any lions. And I have a nasty feeling that I may have missed them going north into Little's Hook if they haven't crossed here. Anyway, let's see what happens as we go. There were some male lions coming out of Chitwa Chitwa, which is to the south of us, and they were going towards Torchwood Camp, which is to the left-hand side of the picture. And of course, lions will move during the night. Some, normally, they will move during the night quite a distance. Sometimes they will hardly move at all, and I'm hoping that's what's going on here. We'll head across to Bifflesworth Dam now and see what's going on there. Scott's finding of those black crown night herons yesterday was just amazing. Right, Scott has turned down towards the central road. Let's hop on with him and I'll keep you posted as the morning progresses. So we've just been keeping an eye on you and James, making sure you weren't misbehaving and having too much fun without us which I'm sure you were. <laughs> uh, sounds like you had some incredible views. And it's one thing that you guys need to remember is that you get spoiled with twice the action that you would ordinarily have if you were out here on safari as a regular guest, stuck on one vehicle with one guide, whereas with Safari Live, you get a minimum of two, provided that all of our equipment is working, and sometimes up to five different feeds when we do our TV shows. So that's something for some of the new viewers to look forward to, is that when we do do TV shows, or Safari's Live to TV, rather, probably a better way of putting it, um, there will be two vehicles, a bushwalk, a safari tent with a little microscope camera and the drone with the live feed as well so there's lots to look forward to there i've really been missing the shots of the drone bird's eye view provided us with some great views of juma ah oh, monkey man fear not you are hoping that we are going to swing past the Buffalo's Hook waterhole in the hope that we will be able to get you a glimpse of the rare and elusive black crowned night heron. We are heading in that direction. So we will have a closer look for you once we get there. Yesterday we were lucky. I mean, I think every evening they will come to the water's edge to feed uh, at around sunset. We may have ever so slightly sped that up a little bit last night as we flushed it from its hiding place in a Tumwerti tree nearby the water. Um, by this stage of the morning, I'm guessing it's already going to be back in its hiding place. And because those Tumwerti trees that they seek refuge in during the day are so thick, it might be difficult for us to get a view. So just a forewarning, it's not going to be as easy as just driving there and ticking it off the list. As its name suggests, it is a night heron, so it is active at night. There's a little crombeck. It's a bird we don't see often. Oh, jumping on the top left. Oh, there it goes. Let's see if... No, it's too far away, I'm guessing now. Oh, Dave's going for it. Good call there, Dave. It is there. Oh, it's just such a tiny bird. Well done, Dave. That was the one that was singing. Crombeck. Crombeck 140. Hello, Sabrina, who's just 12 years old, and you'd like to know if picking up a feather like this is going to possibly uh, cause you to pick up a disease. It's what your mother has told you. 
depends on where in the world you are, Sabrina. I guess there is a chance that there is some kind of an epidemic uh, going on in whatever country you may live in. But I find it unlikely that uh, feathers, by picking up a feather, you are going to get a disease. Um, so maybe your mom is just scared of them. Uh, I know one of my friend's mothers <laughs> is terrified of baby birds. It's the most bizarre thing. Once uh, we were on a, my friend's farm and we found this little goose, tiny little gosling, the cutest thing you could ever imagine. And we adopted it, took it home, and we put it in the kind of laundry area, an extension of the kitchen in a box with some food. And we were having lunch or just doing something in and around the house and I heard this blood curdling scream. <coughs> and I thought we were under attack. I thought this was it. It's the end of the it's the end of my time here on the planet. Somebody has come to finish us. And we went running to go and save his mother and we got to where the screaming was, which was eventually the laundry, and we found her there in a complete state of panic. Um, <laughs> Yes, Mohammed, there is a chance this, there could be some fleas or lice that live on the bird that's sitting on this feather that's going to crawl into my hair. But it's not going to kill us. Um, I'm sure, you know, I, I think the way the world is going and, and a lot of people that live in cities um, have become so clean and sterile that especially parents looking after children and like not allowing them to roll around in the dirt as children do or children are supposed to do that and because i think certain parents and this is just my opinion so please don't take it too seriously it's just the thoughts but i think because people are being so, living such sterile lives it's causing people to pick up sicknesses because they're not actually picking up immunities and building immunities against little bits of bacteria that you should be from a young age. So I think that's a cause for a lot of the allergies and everything that people are getting. It's because they're being living in this little kind of sterile chamber for their lives and there's nothing wrong with a little bit of dirt or a feather here and there or you know think of how we used to live. There was no soap no dishwashing liquids, detergents, but we as humans survived here, living in caves, living a far less sterile lives than we live at the moment. So I think there's something that we need to remember about the, our, our past and where we have evolved from. We didn't just arrive in cities with everything clean and neat and orderly. You had to pluck feathers from birds that you would have caught in order to eat. You would have had to pluck your own chickens so, yeah, I think we need to remember that, that we are, are potentially tough animals. Elaine in Michigan, you think that this feather could be from a cuckoo? And I... convinced Elaine. It's gone a bit funky now. It's not as looking as good as it did after it floated out of the sky. It could be a cuckoo. To me, this is not a tail feather. This looks like a wing feather, um, possibly from the left hand side of the bird, because here's the forward edge and here's the trailing edge. So it wouldn't fit on the right hand side of the bird because then it would be the wrong way around. Sorry, I've just kept quiet because I can hear lions roaring. But the fact that I'm having to listen so carefully to try and work out what's going on is the problem. They are that way. They are to the east and we're very close to our eastern boundary. So, no good there. Elaine, cuckoos. Let me get them in the book for you quickly. Did I show you guys the long-billed Crombeck earlier? No. Apologies. Forgot about that. I have to see my books open. Oh, that's the critter that flew away. 
long bill, kind of. Not the longest bill I've ever seen, but a very short tail, no tail, really. So that's a very dis uh, distinguishing feature. It should be called the short-tailed Crombeck, I think, would be a better description, as its bill is not nearly as distinctive as that short tail. But that's the bird we saw fluttering off earlier. Thanks. Now, the cuckoo. Let's get the cuckoos out. Now, I don't think there's any cuckoos that are brown enough. You, uh, Elaine, mentioned something about the greatest spotted cuckoo. Um, but I don't think it's that either. Okay, so... <coughs> mainly black and white, the cuckoos. At least on this page. Here's... Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Louise has just blessed me from the final control room with that sneeze. Here's the greatest spotted cuckoo over here in the middle. Um, so I don't think it could be that one, or maybe a wing feather from it, maybe. Then let's page over to the other cuckoos. Also grey or, or greens, unless it was maybe a juvenile or a f male Deirdrick cuckoo in its bronze form. I don't think it was one of those. All right, well, we're going to continue our search and try and work out where the Inkuhuma lions have gone. I know James hasn't seen any tracks crossing out of the property yet, but that's not to say that they haven't. The roads that he's driven are quite tricky to see tracks on, and especially when the sun was a little bit lower is when he was driving those roads. So now that the sun's risen a bit, it may be a bit easier to see the tracks to work out whether they are still on Juma or not. And as we go there, we are going to be sending you back to James on his adventure. We're just sitting under a Tamboti tree here, and there is one interesting thing in the tree and four interesting little things underneath it. And in the tree is a foam nest frog's nest. Now, unfortunately, the tadpoles of that foam nest frog or grey tree frog are going to land with a heavy thud upon the ground, and I think that's going to be the end of their lives. Uh, the foam nest frog normally builds that foam nest over water so that the tadpoles, when they hatch, and sort of eat their way out of that protective covering, drop into the water, and then they grow from there, going through that spectacular vertebrate metamorphosis, which turns them basically from fish, almost, into adult frogs. But I think that one, of course, is just hanging over the bare ground, maybe an inexperienced female frog, maybe a desperate female frog, given the lack of water this year. And, of course, no puddles around. Then we've got four yellow-billed hornbills. Well, there's only two now. The other two have just disappeared. And they are feeding on termites that are coming out of the ground. And that other one's got something else. But she seems... I don't know what he's doing with it. it looks like a piece... What do you think that is, Jean? It looks like a piece of dung, maybe. Oh, it's a dung, yeah. That he was going to give to his friend, and his friend said, no, thank you, I don't want any of that. Now, to me, I've said this before, but I've only just learnt it, and I've often wondered how on earth it is possible for a bird with a beak th that long to so sensitively pick things up off the ground without sort of clanging its head into the floor or missing. So they're picking up individual termites and individual ants. You can see the amazing ability to do that. And they do that largely with feel. They can see to a certain extent, but obviously, you know, there's a point at which they cannot see the end of their beaks. And to be able to pick up individual insects from the ground, they must be able to feel them. And so the beak is actually an incredibly sensitive thing, which is just incredible. And they always just look slightly disturbed with each other, slightly, slight consternation with each other, do the hornbills. I think they're great birds. OK, they've just gone into the trees there, John, don't worry. Uh, we're going to carry on along the road here. I'm heading now in a easterly direction from... Oops. of Dam, and we're heading back out onto the Bivles of Cut Line in case I've missed those tracks, and I'll just look a bit more carefully on our way around this time. And Micah, you say that those hornbills are look, they, they look hilarious. They do look hilarious. I agree with you completely. And they're going to be very happy hornbills at the moment, and along with many of the birds, because there was a great emergence of termites last night, and I thought there might be 
After the rain, the soil becomes soft and then the sun comes and it warms everything up and so you have these emergences of insects and that's exactly what we had last night. Emergences that have uh, been sorely lacking during the course of the year. So we're going to drive very slowly along here. We'll look for some small things, of course, but the lions have definitely stopped calling wherever they were calling from. And that's not surprising because the sun has come up and it's normally just before dawn that they do their last call. And like I say, I think it's going to be a hot day. The lions will know that. They'll go and find some shade to sit in and there they shall remain. Wonderful. Mary, Mary, you're in um, Panabagua or something. Tanandagua, I don't know where that is. It sounds like a fascinating place. You live apparently in New York State. And you want to know about the rules of keeping a bird list and how stringent are they? And do you have to see the bird or can you just hear it? Or if, and if you see it on the Juma Dam cam, does it count? and you say that you might struggle to keep an honest bird list. There are many twitchers around the world, Mary, who struggle to keep an honest bird list. I saw a list of somebody who, um, one of the viewers the other day, and it had some species on it been seen here. Well, uh, it would have created a, a, enough material for an ornithological conference. So certainly there are many who see birds that perhaps are not quite where they were suspected to have been. But Mary, if you are out in an area like this, the general convention is that yes, if you hear the bird, I mean, all it is is, is you know, solidly identifying that a bird is in an area. So you can do it from sound. So if you know the cause sufficiently well, then absolutely you can do that. If you see them on the Juma Dam cam, of course you must put them on your list. Absolutely. I always think it's a nice thing to, to be able to see them, but if you can identify them from sound, especially, you know, because the camera is, I mean, it's quite awkward to move around, and if we see a little flitting tiny bird going across or an eagle flying way up in the sky, then sometimes it's a little difficult to get a proper picture for you. And so then I think you should be feel confident writing it down on your list. So please do keep a list. And for those of you who don't know what Mary's on about, uh, there are a lot of viewers who are keeping a list of the birds that they see here, some keeping mammal and reptile and amphibian lists as well. But I think the bird list is the, is the most common and certainly I think the most enjoyable. Ooh, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Impala going crazy. Impala going crazy just up ahead there. The road goes around, gets head down there and see. Hold on, Jean-Dre. Hold on to your hat. You're not wearing a hat. So just so that Louise can maybe tell Scott, the Impala are alarm calling on Biffleshook East Road, but somewhere close to the cut line and the fire break. could be lion, it's unlikely to be wild dogs there, the impala are. They look completely chilled out. I didn't give it a very careful listen. It's possible that they were just shouting at each other. And they look very relaxed, don't they, jean -Dry? Maybe they were just, it might have been just males having a bit of a fight with each other. I don't see anything here. No tracks. 
Okay, let's go to Bilhazog Dam where Scott is and we'll have a little fossick about here for a few more tracks. See you shortly. Well, some exciting stuff over there. Always a rush trying to work out what is alarming or exciting. The most numerous antelope here, the impala. I thought you guys are about to find a leopard, but alas, maybe next time. So we've arrived at the Bufflezook waterhole. No sign of the night heron. It was doing its business right in the kind of middle here late last night as the Inkuhuma drank. From right over there, for those of you who weren't with us, that's where they settled down at the bar. We had an incredible night here last night, so apologies if you weren't with us. And let's try and see if we can recreate some of last night's brilliance and find you that black crown night here. And they were in the trees, Tamboti trees, just in the little dip as you go through the waterhole below, not through the waterhole, through the riverbed that will flow out of this waterhole. I've heard a cuckoo calling here, so I may get to see that as well. Hello, PK in Iowa. You would like to know how many different types of herons we get in this area. The Goliath heron and gray heron are the two most common herons that we see here in the Sabi Sands, but you would occasionally also see the black crown night heron, which is the one that we're looking for now. The green backed heron. Who am I forgetting? There's a couple of different ones. I'll get my book out and show you all of the ones you get in the Greater Kruger National Park. Now, I'm guessing that these birds, I don't know them very well, not in here. Um, I'm guessing these birds are going to be using very similar perches to hide out in during the day. And the perch that they flew out of yesterday when I saw them for the first time actually wasn't this tree. This is where they flew to as a second refuge. They were initially just up on the left chair, so let's creep along and see if they aren't there. I think that they might be. Let's just hope they don't get a fright fly off, if they are in fact here. They're not big, they're not as big as regular herons. So, not as easy to spot as some of you may think. Huh. Nothing to see over there. The sneaky heron have dodged us. Oh. Sorry, guys. No joy. Well, there may be somewhere nearby-ish. Let's hope that the... Oh, there it goes, the sneaky thing. Well done, Dave. Great work. And let's just see where it lands. Ah, a little sneaky night, Aaron. Where did you take off from? I think somewhere behind us in a very, very thick tamboti. Let's go back. It's gone and landed in the same tree that we checked for the first time, or check, that we checked initially. Well done, Dave. I'm happy that you got to see it flying. Not the best views. Well, I'm glad. Let me try and reposition the vehicle. We have a very awful spot here. We're just gonna skedaddle down this little riverbed. Hopefully get you a better view. It's sitting in a big open dead tree. There's just a lot of foliage between us and it. Oof. This is not gonna be easy. Yeah, there's just too much bush between us and it, but we might get a little gap. Uh, it took off. OK, 
go one more try and then we'll leave it be because we don't want to give it too much of a hard time. I have seen where it's landed and I think we shall now get the shot we've been hoping for. There's two of them that are lurking here. So one of them is watching from its hiding place as, it fr as its friend flies around. Okay, David, it's just in the tree on the right here. Just in this next tree over here. We're going to be so close to it that I fear that it will try and fly again. Maybe not. It's gone to the right. <laughs> I think the evening's a better, better time to do it. Um, it disappeared behind the damn wall there. Oh. It's coming over there. Yeah, we're going to get great views. This is going to work. Look at that. Beautiful. Um, we'll leave it be a... a I'm happy you got a glimpse of it. Let's see if it doesn't do one more lap. Yeah, it looks like it's coming around for a second lap. We should get another view of it coming in now, Dave. Beautiful. We're going to get some more. Oh, no. It went the wrong way. But it could still come. It just disappeared below the tree line. If it comes back again, David's going to have a little bit more time to lock, lock his sights onto it. But... Alas, it disappeared. I don't blame it after we've been chasing it from perch to perch. Very, very good. Well, it's a great pleasure, monkey man. I'm glad we got you a glimpse of the black crowned night turn. Let me show you guys in the book quickly. Where are the herons? So you'll be surprised how small it was. I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of you at least are surprised at how small it was and short. Ordinarily, herons have got very long legs and long necks and these are five herons that we get in this area on this page. The purple, which you don't see very often or ever. I don't think we've seen the black-headed, which is interesting. It's kind of like a kingfisher that uh, a lot of the kingfishers that don't eat fish. This is a heron that also lives in the bush veldt and doesn't require water. Uh, uh, moving east, so away from fish rock. that's another one that uh, we get here. Southeast. The black heron. How cool is this? They do this yeah, kind of every, umbrella uh, formation. Yeah, and fish and small animals will seek refuge in there and then they'll catch them. So they create a haven that they then make very inhospitable by consuming everything that lives there. Then on the next page we have our star here, the black crowned night heron that we've just seen. And a few other of the shorter, the dwarf herons you could say. Hello, Morning, Scott. James. I see that your bird book was cool. made Thanks, roughly Dave. the same time as my um. Yes, a good matching binocular. pair. Yes. Look at how well they go together. Cute. <laughs> <laughs> I think these lions flew away. Really? No, no joy. No, and I really searched very carefully. I wonder if they don't, if they didn't have some meats or something in in the bushes Maybe. that they've headed back to. There is. Have you run over some? some of the dung possibly yes no but they, they did it's just, oh. i'll tell you where it is if you reverse it a little bit a it's just it's there. just a little mm. spot we actually we, we captured that oh, genre and filmed so. that oh, yesterday very nice. that, that the jippo whole, guts yes wonderful um how, how entertaining that must it be. was mm. <laughs> it was super um okay well if what the lions don't plan? want to be seen then we shall find shall something we else press on <laughs> yeah. something else yeah I think we can't force the issue. I don't know what they would have done. I'm going to just drive the fire brake, maybe. Okay. I'll turn around, drive the fire brake back, and then head to the south. Okay. If that's all right. That's perfect. Okay. That sounds like a very good plan. Okay, guys. Well, we are going to be. Uh, where are you going to go? You're going to go back this way. I think I'll go back that way. Well, yeah. you don't want to do the westerly road. I have done the westerly I, road. Yeah. Okay, I mean the easterly road. Yeah. 
I like the way you just, you did nothing there. You just assumed, you just allowed me to make mistakes there. Very kindly. Um, <laughs> getting my directions wrong. Okay, well, we're gonna se uh, send you on to James's vehicle now, so hop over and Come good on, luck. Everyone. Good luck, goodbye. Goodbye and good luck. Okay. Cheers, See James. Later. See you later. Bye-bye. Okay. I'll just give you a view of the dam. Well, I mean, you've had a look at the dam. But there it is again. And a final acceptance that the lions are not here. And we'll do... Well, the fire break, just to keep give you an idea, is the road between the f cut line, the buffers or cut line, which we were on just now, and... Um, well, it's the road between the buffers or cut line and the main piece of Juma and it's just a bit of a clearing and there is a sort of track that runs along it around about where I had those impala alarm calling but we saw the impala and I, I don't know maybe they were just having a bit of a fight with each other maybe they didn't actually see a lion at all and as Scott maybe those lions have got some meat inside here and this road I mean this road here is particularly hard so they could have gone across James Richard, you say maybe those in parlor were just hoping for some screen time. Well, yes, they might have been, I suppose. I'm just watching carefully here. There is a very loud clunk in the air. I think there's a lion track here. One. Very indistinct lion track. I wonder if Scott isn't correct. intuition about animals is often often 100% on and I wonder if he's not correct that they've gone in there because this road is not easy to we're see tracks on. Two Can you see with it? Okay. Anyway. Time will tell. Time will tell everyone. They will emerge. I suspect if it's a hot day and they are in there on a carcass, they'll probably come back towards the dam during the course of the day. Okay, mobile Paddy, I'm not really sure how to answer this question. You say, <laughs> what do you... No, in fact, I can't answer it. I'm going to ask for the question again so that I might formulate a response. <laughs> How would you describe the mammal Scott? Are, are they endangered? What do they eat? What do you call a group of Scots? Uh, well, mobile paddy, I suppose they could be considered endangered, as there's only one of them. So definitely, yes, highly endangered, critically so, I would say. Um, what do they eat? Uh, they eat just about anything um, in fairly large quantities, uh, but normally at odd times. Not normally at the sort of meal times that most people would eat. And um, a group of them, well, they, you know, they didn't, there used to obviously be large herds of them, but now there's only one left. And I think they used to be called a scribble of Scots. <laughs> Let's move on to the next topic, shall we? So this is the fire break to the left-hand side. the Twitter handle roll on me and you <laughs> and you, you want to know if this waterhole where we were just is the same waterhole where there was a hippo at one stage yes indeed there was we had Bob the bachelor of Biffle's hook for a long time but he has left now because there was no water for many many weeks and indeed I don't think that this water will last long unless there is further rain, but there is no further rain predicted for this week. And Alex Rasputin Wozniewski, who does our 
technical stuff has got some kind of underground, remarkably accurate weather app, and he says no rain this week. But it is just remarkable to me the amount of green grass that has come as a result of the grass that we had. Now, just watch out here, everybody. Watch out, Jandre. Now, I'm going to try and avoid hitting Jandre in the head here, and that's mainly for the benefit of Ellen Fowler, who says she's very, very pleased to have Jandre back. Ellen, we're all quite pleased to have Jandre back. Um, you know, he has got his suspicious sort of haircut and facial hair, but, you know, we let him get away with those foibles on account of his great skill on the camera. So we're all so very pleased to have him back. Thank you, Ellen. Here, simply because I want you to hear the bird calling, the crested barbet. And there is a virtual starling that Chandra is showing you now. And we're at the northern end of Buffelshook Dam here, I'm just seeing if we can't spot any sign of lions, no sign yet. That's the virtual starling, Chandra, just quickly come down here. Here's the, here's the, um, the crested barbet. Just in there. Hit him. And he's a fruit-eating bird, and he's landed himself... <laughs> he's landed in a guari bush, and the guari bushes have just started to fruit. He's such a pretty bird. and I will try and pick some of those. Well, let's just get hold of Scott quickly. Scott would like a word. Go ahead, Scott. James, uh, east of Road. Are you listening to this, everyone? I'm sure the ladies do still have some yama somewhere in this valley. I don't know if you want to check in the other road north. Okay, copy, I will do that. Hmm, that's interesting. Right, so what's happened is that Scott has spotted some vultures basically to the west of where we are now, exactly in the direction where he said he thought the tracks or the lines may have gone. And so we'll go, he's going to search around that area and we'll go and do a loop in a similar area. I don't think that they've come where I'm sitting now. Well, clearly they haven't exactly, but there are no tracks here at all. It's such a pretty morning, though just to sit and be in the bush. Marvellous. All righty, on we go. Jandre, let's get an update from Scott quickly, and I will see you in his general vicinity. So, it appears like there may still be some reason for these vultures to be here. I mean, Looking at this individual, it's hard to say whether it's eaten yet or not, but the problem with so early in the morning is that these vultures may have hung around hoping that they could get a snack from the lions, but the lions may have finished everything, and the vultures simply haven't left yet because it's not warm enough. There are no birds of prey flying around, and they probably will only start to in about half an hour, 45 minutes once. The Earth's crust has heated up, Warm thermals will then rise up off the Earth's crust, and this will make flying for the birds a lot easier. But we could get lucky, and what I'm going to do is just drive a little bit further, and if we don't have any like this, only one vulture that you can see there, but there are more dotted around in other trees. Some a little bit to the left behind it, and some a little bit to the right in front of it. They're going to be difficult to see, though, so we'll just keep going for now, but take my word for it, there's vultures both north and south of that individual. There's one right in front of us, and that's the other difficult thing when there's one right in front of us. That's the other difficult thing about responding to vultures or using vultures as indicators for kills. They aren't necessarily going to be sitting directly above the lions for a number of reasons. Mainly, there's not always going to be a tree 
any tree right next to the lions. In this case, though, there's quite a few trees, but not the right trees. Dead trees are the best trees for vultures to perch themselves in because it's easiest to land in and take out of. It's a lot more difficult to land in trees with lots of leaves, thorns, obstructions. So that's why the one vulture we saw was sitting in a dead tree over here, the other vulture sitting in a dead tree over here. They could be a couple of hundred meters away from where the lions are, if the lions are still here, which I think is going to be the case. It'll be interesting if it is, because it means the lions would have left their kill. All four of them would have completely abandoned their kill to go and have a drink last night before returning to it possibly. So obviously while they're gone, anything could have happened. Hyena could have come in and had a snack, who knows? Even a sneaky leopard may have sniped some of their meal. James Richard, you would like to know from an evolutionary standpoint, what would make sense? Why would the night heron not just be a regular day heron like the rest of its friends? And possibly more food. Let's, it looks like this vulture's gonna take off. Before vultures take off, they like to go to the toilet though. I guess it's common for most birds. Um, James, I think it's pos possibly to capitalize on different food. I think frogs are typically more active at night, so let me check in my book quickly what it says about their exact feeding habits. Food, fish, amphibians, reptiles, small birds even, up to the size of a laughing dove, small mammals and insects. So they've got a wide diet. But yeah, it is interesting, possibly less competition at night. Oh, and while I was looking at my book, that starling just arrived, David and Goliath. How awesome is this? Let's try Let's try and get a little bit closer. Capitalize on this little moment. Stay on it, Dave, if you don't mind. I'll try and drive slowly, but I'm just worried if it flies off, I want to be able to stop immediately, and then you can just continue panning and following it, so I think it is going to take off. Ooh, ooh, thinking about it. Please don't do it as we disappear behind this little bush. I've got a <coughs> little flight. Well done, Dave. We captured that first flight, initial takeoff. Let's see if we get another one. If not, we'll just stop here because we're going to be so nice and close to it. Off it goes. Beautiful. Where are you going to come and land now? Oh, wonderful. Great work there, Dave. And it just flew basically directly in towards the sun. So there's no ways of Dave combating that bright moment you had. So there was one vulture here in this dead leadwood tree. There's another one just up ahead of us in another dead tree. Where are the lions? Where was their kill or where is their kill? Hmm. Just gonna drive a little bit further along just to make sure they're not close to the road. And thereafter, I think I'm going to need to take a short walk in here to try and establish what is going on. So interesting how you saw that first vulture that we showed you was probably a couple of hundred meters away from this one over here. They do spread out quite a lot when waiting for the predators to finish their snack so that they can fill in to, uh, slip in to finish off the remains. Hello, 
Hello to Cookie Jar. You would like to know what is the difference between a mountain lion, or I guess what you would also call a cougar. I think it's the same thing. Fairly confident about that. And one of our African lions. Uh, size is probably one of the major differences. An African lion is considerably bigger. I'd say probably twice the size of a cougar or a mountain lion. Possibly even triple the size depending on the area that the cougars are found in. I think they vary quite greatly in size. So that's one of the things for me. Another thing is that African lions will live socially. They are communal cats, social cats, whereas mountain lions are not. And that's probably one of the biggest distinguishing features between lions and any other cats, really. They are very different in that regard. Okay, well, I feel like we are getting colder. I feel like we are no longer in the danger zone. No more vultures, and I'm just not feeling the lions are going to be close to us here. So, oh, there's a black-headed oriole there. That's just no, oh, no, it's not. Very bright yellow bird, but it's, it's fluttered away. Eileen, you'd like to know what kind of vultures we've been looking at. Thank you for asking, I should have said earlier. They are the white-backed vultures. They are the most common vulture we see in this area. Other vultures that we could see that look similar to that is the Cape Griffin vulture, but that's got a lighter coloration in general and a very light eye. They've got a very pale eye, whereas the white-backed vulture's got a dark eye. And that's the one major thing. The other vultures that we'd see as a hooded vulture, but that's got a very small, thin beak. That's a black-headed oriole that we can hear calling now. The same bird I wanted to show you earlier. But it's right at the top of the tree. Let's see if we can't find it, though. Oh, that's such a nice call. Whoa. Just fell into a little hole there. Could work well, actually, for an angle on this bird. But... No joy. Oh. Just want to stay up. Keep the, oh, I think we will be able to get a view of it. Let me just try and turn the vehicle around. We may just get it off. Off it goes. It's just about to land in that dead tree over there, Dave. We're not going to see its colors, but we are going to see it. Which one is it? Is it that tree there? Yeah, somewhere. There we go. We might be able to see it calling. We're probably not going to see its bright yellow coloration from here. The sun is not in our favor. But that is the black-headed oriole calling a bright yellow bird with a black head. Hence the name. Wonderful. Well, we're going to send you back to James's vehicle now, and I'm going to take a short walk below where these vultures have been perched, and hopefully we are going to find the Inkuhuma ladies with what I'm guessing may be a buffalo kill. Toodle do. Are we live? Hello, everybody. I said we'd try and find some fruits of the gwari bush, and here we are. Now, the gwari bush is this bush here. It's quite a common tree, uh, very inedible leaves, <laughs> and therefore used often by the cats to mark their territories because they know that no browser is going to come past and eat where they have just marked their territory. Now, there are fruits you can see all over the tree here, and some of them look like they've come a little bit ripe like these red ones. They're normally a sort of deep purple color. But what's interesting is that the red ones here, I've got no moisture in them at all. And I wonder if the fruits are actually going to ripen this year at all, or if they're just going to kind of die off on the tree because of a lack of moisture. It'll be very interesting to see. I'll bring you some. You can have a look at them more closely. There you are. Can you see them there, Jean-Dre? There we are. And they will normally go a sort of yeah, purple color, and you can make a dye out of them. 
They're quite sweet. They're not delicious. Like many of the fruits out here, they've kind of got some defensive mechanisms. They're quite tanniny, so you can pop them in your mouth, suck them quickly, and then spit them out, and then they're quite nice. But otherwise, they tend to be fairly unpleasant. But not many fruits out here, so you can't really be too uh, choosy about the fruits that you eat. OK, we've come back along the fire break. We checked the fire break. There are no tracks there. I'm pretty sure that Scott's intuition is correct. So we'll head around to where he is and try and help him out there. I also just heard some Franklins going crazy in here earlier. And maybe there's some other predator gone towards the dam to have a drink. We're going to have to go past the dam uh, or the little water hole in order to go to where we want to go. So maybe we will be lucky when we get there. It would be very nice. And Anna Marie, you would like to see a snake today, a terrifying mamba or perhaps a cobra. Uh, Anna Marie, I would also be very happy to see a snake. And we had an amazing reptile day yesterday. We had four monitor lizard sightings and a massive leopard tortoise sighting, which was fantastic. So maybe we'll be lucky today with the reptiles. And I suspect quite strongly that today would be a good day for reptiles. Um, they do like the moisture, and after the moisture, they come out and they tend to go foraging. And I think that's why we saw so many tortoises yesterday and so many monitor lizards, and perhaps there'll be a snake or two, a mamba or a cobra. Interesting, I've very seldom seen cobras actually in the wild. I've seen them often in homes and in rooms but not so much out here. Mumbers, plenty. I've seen many mumbers out here. What I haven't seen since I got here, though, is a puff adder. And I think that they are very spectacular snakes. So I'd like to see a puff adder. Anna Marie, would a puff adder do? just reminding me that Brent found a puff adder. Yes, Louise, I do remember that. It's just that I don't. I haven't found one in the wild. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think there was any particularly voracious predator being alarmed at by those Franklins. Anyway, this is also, of course, where we, where Scott saw, with the help of VM, that new male leopard, well, relatively new to us, called Gijima, and he did precisely that. He gijima away, he ran away, and I think he's pushing into Mbula's territory as the old boy gets a little bit more frail. We're back in the water. Marjorie, you're in Texas and you are concerned. You've heard or someone's told you that Karula has to kill three or four times before she's able to enjoy her kill because her kills get stolen. Marjorie, what is that hopping about on the floor there? Marjorie, while I answer your question, it's just something that has arrested my attention here. Um, a very good... Uh, she, she will have some of her kills stolen, Marjorie, but not always. In fact, I'd say probably only about 20% of them, maybe, get stolen. Um, she's pretty good at hoisting her kills. So I don't think that... Um, oh, it's a, it's a moth that's come to the end of its days. <laughs> it was just fluttering in the wind. Isn't that a wonderful sighting, Chandra? <laughs> Is that the highlight of your return to the bush so highlight far? Highlight of my life. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. No, not the best sighting in the world. Anyway, so Marjorie, she will lose about 20% of her kills, but most of the time she manages to hoist them into trees. So she certainly doesn't have to kill three or four times before she's able to enjoy a meal. Now, that is unquestionably untrue. There's not much going on at the water here. Righty, let us continue. We'll be going down Nyala Road now, which is the road that goes into the drainage system in, to which Scott is also walking, having a look. 
I can't tell you how wonderful the atmosphere this morning is. Catfish, you think we need to play a game where the presenters basically stalk each other and try and film each other without being seen? That would be fine, Kevin, except that with the camera and the sort of broadcasting of the signal thereof, it's not just the camera. The camera comes, of course, with an enormous amount of equipment. And trying to be stealthy with that enormous amount of broadcasting equipment is almost impossible. So it would be very easy to see, to see the presenter coming up behind you. You'd hear them thundering through the bush, either in a Land Rover or with the bush walk pack on. Hmm, no further signs. Rusty Pipe, hello. You want to know Rusty Pipe? You say that I'm quite knowledgeable, and therefore, could I tell you why there is a loop on the back of my shirt here? Rusty Pipe, I think that um, while I have a little bit of knowledge about the wilderness, there are more vultures than there. Yes, something has met it an untimely demise at the claws and teeth of lions in here. We are precisely opposite where Scott has gone into the bush. So if you look across where those vultures are, that's where Scott is looking for the lions. And while we just listen and see if we can't hear any sounds of feeding, Kirsten has suggested that this loop in the shirt is for girlfriends who might want to reel their men in. That is, of course, a ridiculously silly suggestion. And the real reason is that, that I think it is a, considered possibly a bush fashion to have a loop in the back of your, back of your shirt. Jean-André? Bush fashion? No. 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 What is the purpose of it then? Girlfriend shirt. <sighs> Genre. Okay, so let's just have a quick talk about those vultures. I know you've seen them with Scott, but let's just have a quick talk about them. Those are the most common, of course, the white backed vulture. I had a wonderful sighting of them the other yesterday. And of course, they don't always mean that there's death. But when they are mixed, there are four or five of them that I can see now. There are two in the tree close by and then three in the tree behind that. You can be fairly sure that something has died. Also, it's now got to the stage where the thermals will start to rise off the earth. And these vultures don't look like they're going to be going anywhere soon. And I wouldn't mind going to have a look underneath those vultures on foot as well, but we'll wait for Scott to get back to the car before we do that. Let's just continue down the road a bit, and we might actually have a little drive up the drainage line. Let's see if we don't spot the lines there. So, the drainage line goes down there. There isn't a road in there, but we could go down onto there and then turn up towards the north. So, Mushi, you say yes. The loop on the shirt is where the wife attaches the leash. Mercifully, I have not a wife or a leash at this stage. I've done very well at avoiding that situation. I'm pushing my 40th birthday this year, of course, and then may remain unshackled, Andre. Now, Kirst, uh, Curtis, a very interesting question about medical plants and which ones are used in South Africa. Well, it's an interesting one. There's a large body of research, actually, that's being 
created by ethnobotanists who do a lot of work on you know, traditional uses of trees and they find out exactly what chemical compounds are within the trees and what, you know, if they are sort of commercially usable and whether they actually have a medical efficacy. Um, but you will find that out in these rural areas, lots of trees are used for various ailments. Now, I think that during the course of, say, the last 20 years, when guiding and being in the bush has become this kind of popular thing, a lot of people have written about trees and their traditional uses, but I think a lot of those are sort of anecdotal and possibly come from the past. And I think that there's probably not a huge amount of traditional medicine at the moment that is done with every tree. So every tree you read about has got some traditional use attached to it, according to the textbooks. I don't think that many of them, however, are used. That said, many, or not many, many of those that are used are used extensively. And I'm trying to, th I don't, I can't think of anything in particular about is used commercially. But there's, for example, the Tamburti tree, uh, which is that small scraggly thing there, and the one in which we had the hornbills earlier, that is used for various things, but it's toxic sap, and it's used for people who are constipated. constipated. Sometimes they use it to try and loosen the bowels. And I'm just going to ease my way in up here and see if we can't get a sight of the lions. Now, Shell, you are asking from Detroit what the name of that buried bush was, and it is called a guari bush. G U A R R I. G U A R R I. Genre, do not get attached to this tree. We will leave you here if you do. Ah! And the guari bush, or the magic guari. So named for its apparent ability to divine water. So if you're a water, so if you're a water diviner, apparently it's a very good stick to use. I don't see a great deal of lion activity here, and of course it gets extremely thick. What I'm going to do, I'm going to put this thing here so that you can see me and hear me. And I'm just going to look over, just over there into the drainage and see if there isn't anything there. And so you will still be able to hear me. And if Louise does want to cut across to Scott, then she can do that. That is a tree. Yes, it is not a lion. <laughs> we have just driven past there. OK, so I'm just going to walk over the top here. If you hear some growling, you will know that I've spotted the lions. This, of course, is entirely safe if you are trained to do it. So we'll just listen here. The chewing of bones. No. No, I can hear Scott starting his car. I can't see anything in here, and I hear nothing either. Those vultures are often, I mean, if those lions may have finished their kill and then moved off again, and the vultures will just sit until, like I say, until the thermals start to rise, and then they'll fly off. Alternatively, they do, have, of course, have brilliant eyes, which means they will sit in the most convenient spot for them. They don't have to be right next to the carpets, especially if there are lions actually feeding on it. But there's nothing through here. And even if there was, it would be impossible to get the vehicle in there. It's quite nice to have areas of the reserve that are inaccessible to the cars. It just keeps them a little bit wilder than they might be otherwise. It is such a pretty morning. Is it not inspirational, Jean-Dre? Yes. Yes. You're so enthusiastic about that. OK. We'll just gently reverse out of here. Okay let's, go across to, okay, let's go across to Scott, get an update from him, and we'll continue our little search through this block. Well, I 
I thought I had got lucky during my little investigation into this area on foot. I saw a little bit of movement, which caught my attention probably about 40 meters ahead of me in some quite thick bush. And I crept down, looked forward, and saw this tail wagging. And behind the tail, I saw this big, dark uh, shape, a buffalo. And I thought the lion had seen me and was flicking its tail in agitation as I approached its kill. But I was wrong. It was two Cape buffaloes lying next to one another, one of which was wagging its tail. So living buffalo was not what I was hoping to find. For a number of reasons, they can be incredibly dangerous when you do encounter them on foot. Um, and secondly, it means that the lions had not caught one, which is what I was hoping for. That's not to say that somewhere else in this very thick area, there is not the lion with the kill, and oh, the yeah, buffalo was simply me. taking a snooze nearby. They may have been uncertain of the lion's position, you know, depending on a number of things. I mean, if the wind was blowing uh, the wrong way, the lion would obviously go undetected to the buffalo, depending on where the buffalo approached him. So it's not uh, uh, hugely impossible that buffalo could be sleeping 100 meters away from lions with a kill. Hello, Ava. Good to have you with us. Had we have found a kill, you'd like to know, would the lions be feeding on the intestines or will they leave that for the hyena? Um, it depends on the animal, um, but generally, most predators will feed on portions of the intestines. What they'll do is they'll milk or bleed out the, uh, in, uh, the vegetable matter, the rumen in the stomach kind of sausage, you could say, and they'll, they'll suck it through their teeth, just feeding on, therefore, the outer meaty layer of the sausage, not the contents, the vegetable contents of the sausage. Various organs will also be fed on, often first, because they're soft and easy to plow through. So yes, the my final answer is yes, lions will eat intestines, but they will be fussy as to how they go about feeding on it. Not much goes to waste out here. Ah, Dr. Debbie, you would like to know how do vultures distinguish between what may be a dead animal or an animal that is merely having a sleep? I guess, you know, practice, they must make mistakes early on in their vulture life. But as time goes by, they probably just, you know, if you try an area have worked out what is dead, kind of more sideways, arms sticking out rigor mortis, as opposed to sleeping. Um, so yes, um, I think it's just trial and error. They've got incredibly good eyes. I'm told that they can see a piece of meat with a diameter of five centimeters, about that big, from a kilometer up in the sky. I'm not sure who worked that out, but the bottom line is they do have very, very good eyes. Little mud wallow here. A sign of the recent rains. Hello, Andrea. You would like to know if there are any American guides working in the Savi Sands at the moment. Not that I'm aware of, but we only are intermingling with a very small portion of guides. Um, the southern Savi Sands has got bigger lodges with bigger guiding teams as a general rule than where we are in the north. There's very small camps here with only two or three or four guides in each one, whereas the camps to the south of the Sabi Sands can have up to 12 or 16 guides at any given camp. Um, and at one of them, there was an American guide uh, who worked at the same camp as James Londolozzi. What is her name? She was good fun. Um, I don't think she is there anymore, though. What was her name? Anyway, so there was, I've experienced one American guide in the Sabi Sands since I've been here, but also a French guide, 
A German guy, the German guy, that was an awesome story. He used to work for Ferrari and he had quite a good position working at Ferrari head office in Germany. And one of his friends had a spare ticket to come on safari. And he said, Sasha, come and join me. I've got this free ticket. And Sasha wasn't really interested. And his friend had to beg and plead and like convince him to come on this free safari. Eventually, Sasha's like, OK, I'll come. I'll leave Ferrari head office in Germany and come on safari if I have to. And good old Sasha ended up falling in love with it, that he, so much so that he went back to Germany resigned from Ferrari and came back, trained and worked as a guide for quite quite a long time here. Then he moved up to Tanzania, managed the camps over there, but basically fell in love completely with everything that is safari. And he <laughs> didn't even want to come out here on a free holiday to start with. So how's that for a change of events? Who else? What other nationalities have I come across? Yeah, just French, German, American that I can think of. Uh, 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 quite a few uh, British people come into it. It's quite popular amongst the Brits. Um, so there was also a guy from England working at the one camp where I worked. And this is, of course, just me and my experiences. There, I'm sure, are guys of all different nationalities. There's huge benefits to coming, especially if you come from a country with a foreign language. Um, you'll be very attractive to employ as a guide because obviously when foreign speaking people come, the lodge has got that base covered. So I think Spanish is one of the most widely spoken languages. That would be a good one. If you can speak Spanish, you'll be attractive to camps. My friend who, the French guide, um, who I speak of, Mark Eschenlaw. You could actually be watching. Mark, hello, please let us know if you are watching. He's one of those sneaky viewers who only tells you afterwards that they were on safari with you. Stowaways, hiding on the vehicle. Um, as are some of you. Yeah. Hiding in the shadows like Gijima, the nervous male leopard that hopefully we are going to find around the next corner. Um, but yeah, he could speak French and Spanish, so very good. <laughs> Shamrock, I'm um, glad you enjoyed the way I can simulate a dead animal. Like that. <laughs> Also mentioned that Nicola Austin could possibly match the audio to go along with that. And yes, Nicola Austin is sitting behind me. I'll show you her foot. There, she's barefoot. Look at that. Barefoot early in the morning. <laughs> I promise you that wasn't Dave's foot. Dave's on the other side of the vehicle. <laughs> you can obviously also hear ladylike giggle again. Not Dave. Okay, before we lose complete focus on our task at hand here, yeah, I've thought of coming back to the waterhole here at Buffelsock because if the lion are in fact in this general area, there's a chance that they would have come back now for a drink now that it's warming up a little bit now that the threat of hyenas is probably subsiding. Hmm, no joy. The lion are sadly not here. Hello, Jangalo. You would like to know how are we protected from the wild beasts that roam Juma and Arethus? I'm just going to go through this dip quickly, where we may lose signal, although it has been good this morning. OK, 
very good. Jangalo, you'd like to know what protects us from the wild beasts of this area? Um, to be honest, it's probably more than anything else the fact that for many hundreds and thousands of years, humans have been the apex predator on the planet. So predators general, and most of these animals, their general response to us is to run away. Obviously that's not the case here because people have been coming to the Saabi Sands, the reserve that we are in, since the 1960s and even prior to that, but mainly since the 1960s people started coming here in greater quantities, armed with cameras, not with rifles, and because many people over many, many years have been coming here, taking pictures of animals slowly, making them understand that we just want to watch them and not want to hurt them or harm them or get involved in their lives in any way. We merely want to spectate. And because of that, the animals have slowly become relaxed with us and not scared of us. And they don't see us as food because of the way that our brain power has allowed us to kind of mentally win a, this relationship battle with them and over time they've realized that you know it's not worth taking us on for food because we were initially apex above them we could initially kill everything and still as a lot of you know can kill things and get in their way um, but because we're not doing that the animals have become relaxed with us that's not to say, oh, there's just a little hornbill flying off here. Let's see if we can't get you a view. Let's pick up a little bit closer. Um, obviously, that's not to say, Jangalo, that they are not potentially dangerous. And there is a possible risk that we could come unstuck. Oh, the hornbill's not playing, playing along, but let's just take this moment to get a little view of it. Oh, no, I've stopped in a terrible spot. Let me roll forward a bit, chap. So that's not to say that we can't come unstuck if we are not careful, but we've all gone through a lot of training. And if you give the animals the respect and space that they need, they typically will not become aggravated with you. So that's the, the bottom line is if we, with our experience and with our training, read into the behavioral signs of the animals, all the indicators that should warn us of an animal that may be in a bad mood, that may be sexually heightened like elephant bulls and must. Uh, you know, you just give them the respect that they need. No difference, I guess, to responding to humans' uh, body language. A lot of the time we read into body language and then act accordingly, and it's the same with the animals. Even though we can't necessarily communicate with them, just by watching them and understanding them, uh, you give them the, the respect that they, they require or they ask for sometimes with low growls or head shakes or behavioral signs. And then they, they kind of are happy with us to do what we do spectate and not interfere there's a golden orbeb spider up here dave um i don't know you know if you just zoom in you should get it though there we go here yeah. we're gonna get some great oh what have you have you just made a kill why did you move so quickly we got perfect perfect sunshine on what is quite a large spider, this golden orb spider. I find it fascinating how they can move on these webs. Obviously, this one's missing how many legs, everybody? Two. It's only got six legs, and it's supposed to have eight. So even with its two missing legs, it's still doing a good job moving around. That line of debris below it is where all of its kills have been stashed and various theories as to why they'll have that. Some people say that it's to prevent other animals flying into the web, so it's kind of an indicator that there's something there. Other things you can see in the web, a little bit above it, Dave, if you just focus on the smaller spider and pan up a bit, there's two different smaller spiders above it. One of which is the male, golden orb web spider. That's the one in the middle. And there's a tiny one above that male with a little silver bottom, that's a kleptoparasite called a dewdrop spider. And it is glistening in the morning sunlight. I don't know, Dave, if you can try and focus on that tiny one above it. I don't know where it is in relation to the... There we go, I think that's right there, but you can see it glistening 
with that shiny abdomen, hence the name, a dewdrop spider. It looks like a little ball of dew, that big bottom of its. And that will steal food from the orbweb spider. Let's go back to the lady. The lady is much bigger than the male, and it looks like she's doing some web maintenance. Look at this. This is absolutely fascinating. Look at her taking the webbing out of the end of her abdomen there, and ah! Oh, you can even see the golden tinge that gives them their name, the golden orb web spider. And isn't this just the most awesome thing to be watching? the intricate design of a spider web. What's fascinating is that from that silk gland, they will be able to produce different kinds of silk. Some are more sticky than others. Some are used as kind of foundation ropes that don't need to be sticky. Obviously, the portion of webbing that they want to catch their prey with will be more sticky, but they can produce different kinds of silk. I'm glad she knows what the plan is, because this is some serious engineering we're witnessing. Hello, Lisa. Oh, sorry, Dad. I just let go of my foot off the brake then. We went rolling forward. Lisa, you would like to know if these spiders are poisonous? And I'll have to start off by correcting a very commonly made mistake. And that is that poison is ingested and not injected or envenomated via teeth. So no scorpions, spiders, or snakes are poisonous. You can eat all of them, you can drink all of their venom, and there will not be a problem. If, however, they are to bite you, depending on the species, they may be venomous. This one is not venomous to us, they cannot bite us. I'm told that they do have venom, but their teeth aren't possible, or they don't have the correct mouth parts to actually be able to bite us. So they are of no harm to us, even though they may have some venom. They are not a harmful spider to us as humans. Anna Marie, you say you feel sorry for all male spiders, and that is very kind of you. The reason why Anna Marie feels sorry for male spiders is that they run the risk of being consumed by the females who are far larger, and that's why the male, you can't see, but he is hiding on another side of the web, so she can't get through to him very easily. They'll always stay on the opposite side of the web to the female. Dave, if you just go up to the male quickly, you'll be, we'll be able to work it out. Here we can see we've, we're looking at the, the, the back, the, the top side of the male, whereas we're looking at the bottom side of the female, indicating that they're on other sides of the web. We need to send you over to James, who's found a bird. He's just here. We're just looking at a grey-headed bush shrike, everyone. We don't see them often, and it will be a new one, perhaps, for some of your bird lists. He's just dropped off this marula tree into the ground. There he goes. There he goes. There he goes. He's in the base of the, the groovier here. You see him? Yes. He's gone. Kind of gone. Oh, how very distressing. It's a beautiful bird, everyone. It's called a grey-headed bushrike. Just while jean is there, I'm going to find him in my book. Just keep checking there, jean -Dre. Maybe he'll pop out. But he makes the most ghostly call, which has given the rise to his Afrikaans name, the Spwerk Fool, which means the ghost bird. I can hear a fluttering, but he, he, he goes like this, he goes... Which sounds like a ghost, of course. Apparently it sounds like a ghost. S for Shrike, correct, Jean-Rey? Begins with an S. 390. Two out of ten. Yes. 
the hill. You can only hope for something as high as a fall. Here we go. Is the grey-headed bush shrike, everyone? A beautiful, beautiful bird. And their other close relative that we get here is the orange-breasted bush shrike, sometimes known as the 007 bird uh, because of its call. I think that's a ridiculous name to give it. It goes... <whistles> That's the grey-headed bushrike. And he's big. He's about, uh, well, he's t almost a foot long. Almost a foot long. Beautiful colour. All right, let's head back to Scott and his spider. She's not going anywhere. She's being a lot more confiding than that bird was. We're going to continue along towards the water. So the lady is still busy doing some web maintenance and we're gonna leave her be as she does that I just thought we'd wait here and give you one last view of this interesting sighting oh there goes a, a dewdrop spider in the background two of them and you'll probably find they may be going to that long line of what will be old carcasses that the spiders fed on, looking for another little morsel or snack. Great. I'm wondering if these Inkuhuma lioness aren't somewhere in this thick bush here somewhere. Ugh. Anyway, one of the difficulties we face is that if we are off the vehicle for very long then we don't get to spend time with you so that is why I'm not going to invest any more time off on foot but I got a feeling that these lions are lurking somewhere the other problem is that to safely be able to explore an area this thick where there are lions possibly lions with the kill where I know there are already a few living Cape buffaloes uh, you've got to go slowly and I found that even the last time I was off on foot the time pressure that I felt I need to get back to you guys puts you in a dangerous situation and I don't feel like being trampled by a buffalo this morning so we're gonna have to just leave it be maybe we'll find the Inkuhuma lioness flying around at Buffalo's at Waterhole this evening just like we did yesterday or maybe they have just moved off and maybe the vultures are just waiting for things to warm up before they fly off. Anyway. Chris, in Arizona, you'd like to know if predators lose their fear of humans, will we become prey? Certainly not. Because the predators in this area certainly do not fear us, but we are not their prey. Obviously, I mean, there's different degrees of how habituated they could become, but, and depending on how they are habituated, but if they are done, if it's done in an organic, slow, natural way, there shouldn't be any problems. Okay, our signal's gonna start getting shaky as we head down into Inyala Road North, this little low-lying area. So we're gonna send you back to James. I sort of feel that Scott and I are looping each other at the moment. He's headed on to Nyala Road North, which is the road we've just come off now. And I think he was on Hyena Road. Anyway, it might be a good idea just to, as it heats up, to go and check bubbles of dam again. Maybe those lions will pop out of the block. We did do a walk through there, uh, which is quite an extensive walk through the block there, just to check if we couldn't find any evidence of those lines, and I'm afraid we found nothing. So, my plan now is to just have a quick look at the hyena den, see what's going on there. Some red-billed hornbills. Um, and perhaps pick up, I know a lot of you were concerned about the hyena that was attacked by the dogs yesterday. Uh, certainly had a large piece of her bottom attacked by six or seven of them bitter and 
and then she backed into this bush and it was amazing to watch how the dogs wanted nothing to do with her jaws. They weren't prepared to take the risk to have be bitten by those very powerful jaws. So we'll go and check if she's come back. If she hasn't, I think we'll check the water hole at Gallego and then possibly up towards Sydney's dam as well as the heat starts to build. There's still a very nice breeze blowing, a nice cool breeze, but every time we stop, certainly it becomes apparent that a stinker is coming our way in terms of the heat at midday today. Richard, you say whenever you see a golden orb web spider, you're reminded of the lyric from Paul Simon that said, the, the spider resumes his golden thread. Um, I'm not familiar with that lyric, James Richard, so if you could tell me which Paul Simon song it came from, that would be great. I enjoy Paul Simon very much. I think he's extremely clever. As a musician, I don't know how clever he is at physics and things like that. As a musician, I think he's brilliant. My mammal luck seems to be back to where it was before yesterday. Anna, you want to know what diseases wild lions fall victim to? Anna, um, the most obvious one, or the most clear one that people worry about is something called bovine tuberculosis, which is a tuberculosis in that infects just about all of the herbivores we get out here, you know, but buffalo specifically, and when the lions eat the buffalo, they pick up the disease. Now, for many years, I'm actually not sure what the status of the current research is, but for many years they thought, well, bovine tuberculosis was probably going to wipe out the lions of the Kruger Park. That hasn't happened. Lion numbers in the Kruger seem to be relatively healthy, so I don't think that that has happened. And although, although it does seem to cause these kind of um, almost lesions in the lymph nodes underneath the armpits or in the shoulders of lions, um, it doesn't seem to have a huge effect. It might maybe, if you know, times are really tough and there was nothing to eat, it would probably take hold in the body maybe and create a problem for the lions, but I don't think it makes a huge difference. Then there is feline AIDS, of course, FIV feline immunodeficiency virus, which is a possible effector of lions. I don't think it's a huge problem out here at the moment, but certainly domestic cats around South Africa have a major problem with it. And indeed, my mother's beloved kitty uh, fell, succumbed to it eventually uh, last year. Don't worry, that kitty has since been replaced by a new version. Um, and then what else would there be? There is, I think there's another one. Oh, rabies they can get, they can get rabies, but also not common. So they're actually amazingly resilient, all those lions. I'm sure there are lots of other little diseases that they get, but those are the main ones that would be sort of threats to the population were they to take hold in their population. Right, we're approaching the entrance to the hyena den. This is a very interesting question from Mobile Paddy. If human beings were to go extinct, which animal would flourish the most in our absence? Or which species, maybe? Um, I'm trying to think very carefully here. I think the domestic rat would certainly have a problem. Um, what do you think, jean -Dre? I'm just trying to... I can't think that, so I mean, what would happen, let's say human beings went extinct tomorrow. So all the cities, all areas where human beings live, cities and villages would become devoid of humanity. So you'd probably find initially it would be rodents and rats that would take over areas like that. Cockroaches and other, what we would term pests, would devour anything that was around. Then, of course, let's assume that we weren't all lying in a rotting pile somewhere, that um, we just disappeared. Um, 
Yeah, I think cockroaches and rats to start with, I think they would find inhabiting our human dwellings the most obvious because they know how to do it already. They would then be replaced, of course, by predators which ate them, lots of little smaller predators. And in turn, eventually, I think what would happen is that the cities and towns would be taken over by bush again. And so the natural wildlife of those areas would start to flourish. That's a very interesting thought experiment. Thank you for that. Just quickly before we arrive at the hyena den, this bush on my right-hand side is called a sour plum. And the sour plum bush had some green sour plums on it earlier in the season, but it doesn't have anything more on it now, and they didn't ripen. So the fruits just kind of disappeared. And that's just because there weren't enough water, I'm afraid. They're delicious little fruits. In cold play, you say the dogs would dominate. That's probably very true also in urban environments, yeah. Feral dogs and feral cats would probably dominate. But I think you'd find it was the little things initially. The rats and the cockroaches. <laughs> Don't it just give you a shiver, John Dre? Shiver down your spine at the thought of all those cockroaches running around. I see no evidence of hyena activity here now. That's not surprising. Now, Stefan, while we pull into the hyena den here, there are two reasons I think this den might be inactive. The one is that the heat of the day has begun, and the second is that I wonder if these chaps haven't moved. They looked like they might be thinking about it last night. So from here, we're going to go to the Gallego pan and check if they aren't swimming in there, recovering from their fight with the dogs. And Stefan, you want to know well, if there's ever been an animal that I have been unable to identify. Uh, Stefan, by animal, I'm sure you probably mean mammal. And the answer is not in this area, no. No, I can identify all the mammals in this area. Well, no, that's not true. I can't identify all of the bats species at all. They're much too difficult to try and identify. In fact, no one can identify them just on sight. And then, Stefan, Remember, if we expand that away from just mammal to actual animal, the whole kingdom, then there will be plenty, especially in the invertebrate world, that I would have no idea about. So lots and lots of insects, which you can identify down to, you can say, well, this is a mantis, or this is a beetle, or this is a stick insect. But to actually get the specific name of those mantises and beetles is very, very difficult. So, yeah, plenty of invertebrate animals that I cannot identify, Stefan. So interesting that there are no hyenas here. Like I say, I suspect they have maybe moved. Oh, and Bill, yes, we did. You want to know if we got the hyena attack from those wild dogs on the 360-degree camera? Yes, we did. And um, Brian stitched it together yesterday. Now, what that does, it doesn't mean that we're, oh, yeah. grief. Sorry about that, everyone. Driving like an absolute moron. Sorry, John, you're looking a bit shocked. Um, Bill, we did, and Brian stitched it together, and it did work, so that's good. Now, we can't actually show it yet. It needs to be processed further, but by stitch together, what, he, what Brian does is he, or all the camera guys do, is they take the seven cameras, they put them into the computer, and the computer then sort of makes the 360-degree circle, but you can't actually view it like that. It's still got to go for a bit more post-production before you can have that kind of 360-degree view, which is so amazing. So I think it's going to be incredible. We'll have the hyenas that side, we'll have the dogs running either side, and I mean, they were so close that we couldn't actually see them in front of the car, but that camera would definitely have picked them up. All right, let's go back across to Scott. I'll go and check the water, and we'll keep you posted on what we find. So, this is one of my favorite things to do. It's a good way to check for tracks. Get the car to drive itself. 
That way you can peer off into the distance. You can also, when in the riverbed, see up onto the banks on either side. For now, all is clear. Although, the birds just started alarm calling up ahead of us. What could it be? The only catch is if you do need to stop quickly. Obviously, I'm a, away from the pedals. But thankfully, the vehicle tends to just stick to the, the tracks that have already been created from driving through this riverbed. I think it's just an inter-little bird chit-chat there. that we're passing by, nothing too serious. Oh. I'm not a good surfer, and I think the reason why is that my balance is terrible, so I'm actually quite scared where I am here because I could topple off at any, any moment. Oh. No, nothing to see. I was just peering down. I thought I saw some interesting tracks, but it looks like it's just a hyena that's walked through here. Very good. I think I shall return to my driver's seat now. There we go. Ah, oh, hit the brake there. That's the wrong pedal. <sighs> nice to stretch the legs on safari. Told you got a view of my lower back there. And I've noticed some strange colorations. There may be some kind of artwork there. I don't want to be promoting that as it's most mother's worst nightmare. And I do not want to have any little kiddies going and following the same thing as me. Naughty. But there may be some kind of a baobab tree that has been impregnated into my lower back. It's actually a renovation of a terrible initial artwork that was a tribal tribal squiggle design, very small one at my lower back, also known as a tramp stamp, that I got with a matching, or matching with an ex-girlfriend when I was 18. Bad move. <laughs> but at least it wasn't her name. Um, it was merely just the fact that we got the same tattoos. Hers was slightly skew. It was a horizontal tattoo. And they didn't do her straight, so you could distinguish the two ever so slightly. And when she decided to get married to another man, I thought I should maybe renovate that initial artwork. <laughs> Chris in Arizona, you'd like to know if I've ever had a guest fall out of the vehicle. Thankfully, no, I haven't. Um, but I do have colleagues that it's happened to. Um, if you hit a bump too quickly while racing into towards a sighting or following wild dogs, that back row acts like uh, it gets major leverage and acts like a catapult, fl flinging people into the air and sometimes out of the vehicle. So. It has happened, but but never to me, thankfully. I've seen some tracks up ahead of us here. I just want to jump out and check what they are quickly. Maybe it's Karula, that sneaky leopard. Hmm. Interesting. It's looking like a hyena, though. Yeah, it's a, it is a hyena. Not easy to see in this kind of loose beach sand almost, because you don't get a very clearly defined track left in the sand. But I can tell that it is a hyena. Just making sure I'm not overlooking anything. Obviously, wherever hy I've found another set of tracks coming across here, and wherever hyena have been moving up and down, it may be in an area where there could be a leopard kill. So even though I haven't seen a leopard track, there could be something that's causing these hyena to up and down in this general area, but... Nothing at first glance.
Aha. Hello, Naomi, in Gauteng, which is a city in South Africa, also known as Johannesburg, or a region of South Africa. Where Johannesburg, our biggest city, our financial hub is. Naomi would like to know if it takes a little bit of time to acclimatize to the city when we do head back there on our two-week breaks. And yes, most certainly, Naomi, a few things that are for me the most pertinent with regards to acclimatization is driving around with other vehicles, having to deal with traffic and other people on the roads. That's clearly something we don't encounter too often here. Obviously, traffic lights, or what we call robots here in South Africa, are also something that you need to get used to, even stop streets, indicating. We never indicate when we turn here. So yes, the driving takes a little bit of getting used to, and just the general noise and hustle and bustle of a city can be a little bit overwhelming once you've been in the bush for six weeks on, which is the general work rotation that we work. Six weeks on, two weeks off. That's how I've lived my entire working career, just about. Working life since I started as a guide after I completed my degree in Cape Town. So yeah, I think that is one thing, Nikki. What's another thing that takes getting used to out here? I mean, back in the city. Yeah, what? Driving was the first Dri one. Driving was the first one for Nicola. Controlling uh, retail therapy is also something that you need to try and get used to. It's the most bizarre thing. Because we can never really buy anything here, we don't use money for six weeks at a time while we're here. Well, unless, you know, we may send our bank card or some cash with whoever's going into town to buy some drinks or sweets or things that don't get catered for us here. But everything else is basically catered for us uh, whilst in the bush. So we don't really have to deal with money and there's no shops where you can spend money. So you find when you get back to city, you can like go to an, an engine, which is one of our petrol stations, where they've got little shops, just like, I guess, around the world, they'll have a little bit of a, a shop there where you can buy cool drinks and sweets and pies. And You leave an engine, a, a petrol station or gas station, with packet loads, like you've been coming out of a, a proper actual grocery store because you just like buying things. So I find that's a problem that I have to try and get used to. You just buy for the sake of buying because you haven't been able to do that for a while, which obviously, <laughs> that's something that takes a bit of getting used to. I tend to do the same thing as well when we head out for a few drinks at the local watering hole. Because you haven't been to a watering hole for so long, you think everyone's your best friend and you like to buy everyone drinks. That's another problem I face when going back to the city. <laughs> I haven't done this for so long. Here we go, everyone, buy, have a drink. <laughs> but yeah, I'm not too sure what else, Naomi. If I do think of anything else to let you know about, so I'll be sure to let you know. But for now, you guys are gonna be heading back to Mr. Henry. Perfect timing as we exit the riverbed. So we have nothing at the Gallagher waterhole, I'm afraid. Uh, just a little bit of shimmering water in the late morning light. Andre, a kingfisher. Oh, it's blown away. Can you still see it? It's ever there. You want to see it? Just not great. Oh, I can see it. Well done. It's that sort of thing with a spiky head in the left, right-hand bottom of your screen. That is a brown-hooded kingfisher. Unimpressive view. Let us continue. So our next port of call, as I said, is going to be Sydney's dam, and we'll see if there doesn't happen to be a... Maybe a herd of elephants, maybe a pack of wild dogs reclining after a heavy meal. Ah, Siberia Zumi. Very good question. How do you tell the difference between a mangrove and woodland kingfishers? Uh, 
Siberia Zumi, the most obvious the thing to tell them apart is the fact that a woodland kingfisher has got a black underside to the bill. They do look almost identical, but the woodland is black underside the bill, red on top, and the mangrove is purely red. Also, a mangrove kingfisher occurs only in mangroves around about the coast, so you'd never see a mangrove kingfisher here unless it was seriously off course. Now, we are on that fire break area again. There are some impalas in front of us. And Naomi, you're in Gauteng, and you want to know when we go back to city, um, do, we, do we find it difficult to drive in the city or be in a crowded place? I think if I hadn't grown up in Johannesburg, I would find it very difficult. But I did grow up there, so it's not too difficult. The traffic uh, results in my saying very bad words, I must confess. I have very little patience with people who drive like imbeciles. And of those, there are many in Johannesburg. Impala don't want to be on screen today. And Naomi, I mean, being crowded places, yes, that does start to affect me. It's quite nice every so often just to go and, you know, be in a crowded place for a little while, like a big bar or something like that, or a crowded restaurant. But then after a few days, it loses its appeal very quickly. There's a strip in Johannesburg called the Fourth Avenue Parker Strip, which is full of sort of swanky restaurants to go along. And I find that I get very sick and tired of that within about two days, two visits or so. Kyle, you want to know how long it took me to learn about all the animals here? I think that was your question. Kyle, um, I'm still learning about all the animals here. Oh, how long it took me to memorize which animals make which tracks, Kyle? Um, Again, still learning. It's well, If you get a very clear track, it's pretty easy to, to learn. You take you a couple of weeks to learn exactly which leaves what track. But the fact, thing is that animals very seldom leave completely obvious tracks. Remember, it depends what they're walking across. They might be walking on stony ground, so they might just leave a little piece of track. They might be walking across a, a rain-capped piece of earth, like a, these lions, I think, have been doing, and that's why we can't find their tracks. And so it's, it's, it's a question of looking for other signs and very unobvious signs. Oh, quickly, go across to Scott to see the relative of the grey-headed bushwhite. OK, we've taken a massive gamble here, everyone. There's a, oh, you little... OK, well... There was a bird. It was the cousin of the bird that you saw earlier with James the Great at Bushrake, but she gone. So we are going to send you back to James, but at least we tried. Goodbye. You. There are some piggies, everyone. One sow, two piglets. And they are grazing along as the heat starts to build to my back. I must say, I think we're in for a real stinker today. Now, two days ago, we had sighting of a... Ooh, everyone's going to the loo. We had a sighting of a, a really emaciated, skinny, unhealthy-looking sow and her piglet, and we wondered if it wasn't the drought that had made her like that. And I said, no, I didn't think so, because although warthogs would be the first ones affected by the drought, none of the others seem to be that badly affected just yet. So I don't think that's what the, the case was. And you can see the sow looks to be in relatively good health. So I think there was some sort of disease that she had. She thinks we can't see her, of course. Hmm. All right, let's pop along. There's just some zebra up ahead. Now, Kevin, you've been watching the damn cam, and certainly before it, it had its tr recent troubles, there seemed to be buffalo and hippo and all sorts there just about all the time during the day, and suddenly there isn't. Kevin, that is simply because the 
advent of those troubles with the damn camera happened at almost precisely the same time as we had the rain. And what that rain has done has put puddles of water all over the bush, which means that the animals don't have to go to that one piece of water in order to survive. So the buffalo, for example, which were all over that place, are now spread out amongst the bush, lying in the puddles. We found one on his own in Biffles Hook yesterday, not Biffles Hook, in um, Arethusa yesterday, and then a few more just sort of lurking about the smaller pans, the more natural pans. And that's why I think, Kevin, I think you'll find as we dry out again, so the action will return to that pan. Beautiful herd of zebra here. Again, going to start hit <laughs> a foal, just having a little frolic, a frolicking foal. So unique striping patterns, as you can see, and the one that you're looking at now, I think is, she's got quite sort of dark black striping all the way underneath her belly, which of course is characteristic of the virtual zebra in this area. In some areas, you'll find that the virtual zebra stripes don't go all the way underneath the stomach. They stop halfway. And certainly the mountain zebra, that is the case. Look at this one looking at us here, jean -Rie. They are so very horse-like in so many ways. They snort in the same way. They sound the same. They uh, buck around and they look the same, obviously. And so I've always had a bit of a soft spot for zebra because I have a soft spot for horses. Are you a horseman, John Ray? Mm -hmm. It'd have to be a large horse, of course, that carried you. One of these zebras would object strongly. <laughs> All right, we're not too far from the water here. Let's go and have a look there. The general state of uh, relaxedness of all these mammals tells me that I don't think that there are going to be any wild dogs at the dam, but maybe a herd of elephants. There are some giraffe. I can see giraffe. I can see more zebra. A great swathe of mammal life awaits us. See that, Andre? Oh, almost giraffe right in front of us. Don't go away. Stop. Stop. That is a very old cow. So old that her horn has moved. I think it's probably detached itself from the skull. I'm going to sneak in here, where we might be hidden from view. One of the zebras is lying down. Not anymore. Is that all right, John? Right, sir. There you can see her horn is uh, sort of, which one broken? I think it's the one facing forward or back? The one facing forward and to the side is, uh, I think, probably detached from the skull. She's quite an old female. You can see the markings on her skin are indistinct. And obviously she's bashed her head, probably running away from something. Now, there's quite an interesting picture here. I'm going to sneak forward very slightly, jean -Louis. And again, you don't get the kind of perspective that we do because you are watching on a screen. But jean if you can get both of the zebra and the giraffe in shot, that would be great, simply because you can get an idea of the difference in size. So a giraffe is actually a massive, massive animal. And those zebra, I mean, if we were going to compare them with horses, um, you would find that they were the size of a sort of, um, I don't know how familiar you are with horse sizes, but they're probably about 14, two hands, so just, just about a horse, but like a large pony is the size of the zebras. And a big one can weigh up to 350 kilograms, which is very large. And so that's, I mean, that's a third only of the size of that giraffe. Now, Naomi, you say, why is it that zebras are so fat? Why do they always look so fat? Well, Naomi, they look so fat because they have what we call a hindgut fermentation system. And that means that they ferment the food that they eat in the hindgut. 
And so if you know where your appendix is, it's at the end of your, or the start of your colon, that thing in a zebra and in an elephant, for example, is enormous. And it is carried by fermentation vat, it is full of bacteria, and that's where the digestive process occurs. Unlike in a giraffe, for example, or a impala or a cow, where the digestive process takes place in the foregut, in the front of the stomach. So they don't have that huge kind of gas-filled vat at the back of the stomach, which makes them have that fat appearance. Genre, this one in the shade here looks a little worse for wear. See what I mean? Mm. Got some mud on him. Standing just as a horse might, resting with his leg. Sort of on the toe. And he's got a number of scars on him. Quite a lot of mud. I think he's just old, you know. I guess he's an old stallion. So he's done well to get to the age that he is. Didn't like me calling him old. I think it's a stallion. Hmm. The giraffe seem to be heading off towards the water, and I'm just gonna sneak forward. Chandra, look at the bird here. Hmm. Look at that beautiful picture there. Hello, Lisa, roll on me. <laughs> Every day, every day we get a wonderful Twitter handle that makes me giggle. Lisa, roll on me. You want to know, warthog, how big do they get in comparison with the domestic dog? Um, I suppose they would be roughly the size of a bull terrier. If you know what a bull terrier is, it's a kind of short, very stocky dog. So, but, well, no, they're not actually. A big boar is, a bull, a big boar is actually much bigger than that. A big boar weighs about 100 kilos, uh, but I think it's very concentrated. They're very densely built. But I, it's like a really big bull terrier, I suppose, would be the, the size of a warthog. Isn't that pretty? That is called a European bee eater. No, it's not, it's called a European roller, not a bee eater. And that beautiful sky blue. Oh, catching an insect, back to the same perch. He li basically lives on that perch. Let's see if he'll fly back there. There we go. <laughs> Every time we come past here, he's over there. And I'm sure you can feel the sense of peace that starts to build as the heat comes, and you can see why we had that question earlier today about the crepuscular nature of our drive, so why we're active dawn and dusk and it's just simply because the animals are, and you can see that they are starting to really calm down. The birds have stopped singing their morning songs, and the animals have stopped grazing. They're heading into the shade to try and escape the heat of the African sun, except that bird who seems to be reveling in it. Ah. Now, Scott has got, interestingly, some wild dog tracks heading down Twin Dams Road towards Shibam, which is astonishing given that those two roads are separated by at least two kilometers. Um, anyway, it seems that the wild dogs have come onto Voyatella, so what I think we should do is move now and go and quickly go past Sydney's dam, which is just up ahead here, and then we'll head down south the western boundary of Voyatella, and maybe we'll be lucky. Of course, no one's been exploring the western edges of... Ooh, look at this bird. He's right here. Yes, he's a little bit nervous now. Very nice, Rondre. Well done. That was so cool. Really cool. That's amazing. He was only about two metres from the edge of the lens. So no one has explored the western fringes of Juma today because the Juma guys, Tax and Aubrey, were not driving this morning. Their guests left today, and so maybe those dogs have been frolicking about there the whole day. Bye-bye. Don't panic. Don't panic. There we go. I'm constantly amazed still at the way the buffalo, for example, at that pan, 
you know how many buffalo there are at the Juma Pan quite often. We drive up there and they still will get up and go as if they've never seen us before. And yet they spend countless hours in the presence of human beings. Carol, you want to know what lodge Taxon and Aubrey work for? They work for Juma, and Juma's got two lodges, Gallego and Buyatera, and they work at both of those lodges. One is a 10-bed camp, if I'm not mistaken, and the other just a six or eight-bed camp. Here we are at the water where there is Jandre Nabe. Apparently, today is not drinking day. There is a saddle build stalk. Do you see the saddle build stalk, Jandre? Mm -hmm. It is that white thing over there. You can see the back end of it. And actually, there are two. You can see in the middle of your screen there, you can just see a little flash of yellow. And that is the saddle on the bill of the partner of the obvious saddle build stalk. Isn't that brilliant? There he is. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to drive quite quickly now towards quarantine clearing, see if we can't pick up some more tracks of those dogs. Let's go across to Scott. He can give you an update as to where he found the tracks. And we may be lucky before the end of the drive. Tally ho, Jandri. So, as James has mentioned, had just a handful of wild dog tracks heading towards this road that we are now, called Shibam Road, which means gun road, is Shibam, is a gun. Interestingly, in Shangan, XI is pronounced Shi, so Shibam is spelled X-I-B-A-M-U kind of don't really pronounce the U at the end. Or well, at least you shouldn't if you're speaking proper Shangan. But a lot of people go Shibamu. But it's more of a silent U at the end. Oh, it goes an Impala. Bucking off to the side. So, I'm guessing that these two dogs that James did get a glimpse of yesterday, I think you guys may have also got a glimpse as well, are called the Manuletti pack, they a breakaway, I think, from at least the Manuletti pack. It's just two of them, one of which is collared. And they've been seen far south of us in the southern Sabi Sands. Just fascinating how far these animals move, wild dogs. They cover huge, huge distances. They aren't bound to territories. And it would be nice if we popped into them again. So to get you at least a better view of them, it would be the third pack that we would have been able to show you. The one pack is called the Sands Pack. The other pack is called the Investec Pack. And this third little pack of two is called the Manuletti Pack. The Manuletti is a government-owned reserve to the north of us that we are open to. Very nice reserve. We actually used to stay there before we had accommodation here at Juma been actually quite a lot of backwards and forwards between our accommodation where we've stayed, but we have stayed in the Manuletti, which is half an hour away. It's quite fun staying across there, quite nice actually, I mean, benefits to everything in life and negatives, I guess. Obviously, an extra hour of travel every day on top of early mornings made us a little bit sleepy, but it was really wonderful to kind of drive half an hour through game reserve to work in the morning and from work in the evening. Also nice just to get away from the workplace, I guess, which is something that we can't really escape now. Gabby, you'd like to know what we do during the day while we're not filming. Um, I like to sleep every day if I can, which we usually can, but sometimes we have meetings and obviously we've got to do emails. Um, Today, of course, uh, for example, we've got a meeting, so an hour after breakfast, we will, so at about 9.30, an hour after the safari finishes, we'll have a feedback meeting where we'll watch some of our drives and get critiqued by ourselves and other people. I think there's a battalion or a bird of prey in the streets are left. I'm going to loop around and see if we can't get another view of it. There's a road that takes us closer by to it. 
So yeah, um, we'll be having a feedback meeting today, which can last anywhere between an hour and two, where the presenters get critiqued, the cameraman as well, and the directors also to an extent. Um, so we'll be doing that, and yeah, a couple of emails, a snooze, lunch, and then the afternoon drive. Sometimes there's things to do, get vehicles fixed, get little bits of random stuff done. I'll sometimes edit some photos or edit together a video, read a book, chill out, do some exercise, go for a run. So yeah, there's a few things that we do between the drives. Yeah, other game drives with the staff who can't come out with us on drive. So we will do extra little staff drives, take the other great, great, great. girls out who are often stuck in the front control room. Ooh, there's a European... Ah, oh, there was a European beater. But it flew off. Um, they're very pretty birds, the European beaters, but they are not very obliging, sadly, so we haven't got you many good views of them. Marilyn Montana, you'd like to know when working on your bird list, will you include male and female? Or will you just, you, you know, do a species check? Usually, um, you'll just do a species. Um, whether it's male or female, it makes no difference. You can still tick that bird off your list. But if you would like to be um, very not strict, meticulous maybe about your list, you could add in male and or female, because in some of the species, a lot of the species, they can look very different. But no, it's not a requirement. Male or female counts for a bird list. Anyone, as long as it's just an individual of a species, you can tick that off your list. You don't need to see both, and either one will count. But like I say, you do have the option, option to be more meticulous if you'd like. Hello, Natasha, David. Sorry, I don't know how that works, if it's Natasha and David or... But either way, Natasha, David, Natasha and David. One of which is in Ontario, or possibly both of you. I'm not sure if you're a couple or what's going on there. Anyway, the two of you would like to know how many species of birds are in South Africa. I mean, Africa. I don't have a clue. Um, We've got 420 that we can see in the Kruger Park, probably about eight or 900 in the whole of South Africa. And I think there's about 10,000 different species in the whole world. No, there must be more than that. I don't have a clue though. But there's, like I said, probably about 1,000 in South Africa, maybe four or 5,000 on the whole continent, the dark continent of Africa. Yeah, sorry. I think that would be a good one for the Google machine. That may be able to help you quickly. Where are the animals? I've been hoping that we're going to have some sign of Karula. The Queen of Juma, Lepidus. But alas, no surprises, she has been hiding from us. And I'm hoping that she has been hiding and secretive. So, for the reason that she has got cubs, there's a possibility that she does still have cubs. We did have one confirmed sighting of a tiny little fur ball about a month ago, three weeks ago now, losing track of time, but quite some time back. Since then, not one confirmed sighting, and there's nothing that leads us to believe that she does still have cubs. However, 
again, it is a rumor until we can confirm that we have seen it for ourselves. But there is talk that one of the guides saw her with suckle marks, indicating that she still has cubs suckling on her little nipples. That was five days ago. Again, I don't believe anything until I see it myself out here. Um, doesn't matter who the update comes from. An example of which is we got a report the other day. Karula is in the Philemon's dip drainage line with one of her cubs. All of us got hugely excited, but knew that Tingana and Tundi were in that general area mating, so it would be highly unlikely that Karula would have her cubs anywhere near that danger zone. And it turned out that Karula and her cub were Tingana and Tundi. So a good example as to why you do not want to believe everything you hear out here in the wilderness. The bush makes people crazy after some time and it can happen to us. We can become crazy. We do become crazy. And that's why we just need to factor in that level of craziness that could occur at any given time from anybody. So guys, I'm afraid to say that the Twitter sphere is in a state of disarray and um, we are not receiving your tweets. So that is why we are some not answering some of your questions. Apologies for that, but it is Twitter's fault, not ours. I've just seen something. I want to run off and see if it's a frog. It could just be a little cocoon or something white. And sometimes the painted reed frogs show white coloration. So let me go and check quickly. There's a tiny little white something here. It's not a frog. Which I was hoping it was. It was a cocoon of some sort. Anyway, before you laugh at my running style, head off to James, please. Okay, everybody, we found some bee eaters here. I hope you came live when Louise said you came live. I was uh, doing my best impression of an Indian accent, but that when we weren't live there, jean -Ray. Look, it's got a golden back, giving rise to its alternative name of the golden-backed bee-eater. It's a very nasty bee-eater, that, because it is not coming back here. Now, a bee-eater, unsurprisingly, jean -Ray eats. jean -Ray wives. No, 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 it doesn't, actually. It, it, it eats bees. And is especially adapted for dealing with the stings of bees and other members of the order Hymenoptera. And here's another one. What they do is that they will often catch an insect and then carry it back to the perch and wipe the abdomen of the insect on the perch to get the sting out. He's gone. Oh, never mind, jean -Ray. And uh, what I find really interesting about that is that a bird is clearly, I mean, knows the front of, the end of an insect from the other and w it knows exactly where the sting is. Who teaches it that? Who teaches it to do that? And I think it's it's one of those astonishing behaviors that has developed over, obviously, many hundreds of thousands of years of evolution. Anyway, that's the bee eater. They don't only eat bees, they do eat lots of other kinds of insects. And they're especially there, oh, it's flying away again. They're especially adapted for that. But there are some birds, drongos perhaps being one, that are able to swallow birds that don't have, um, or that, uh, with their stings, and their stings don't have any kind of deleterious effect on the bird, which is interesting. So it goes all the way down the gullet and into the stomach, and sometimes the, apparently the stings will get stuck in the alimentary canal, but it doesn't actually have any effect on them at all, which I think is quite interesting. And then I know you were looking at a cuckoo recently with Scott, and they specialize often on eating hairy caterpillars. Now, a hairy caterpillar, for those of you who don't know, will walk around on you, and they, I mean, those hairs leave you with rashes, horrible itching. 
and the cuckoos develop the ability to just sort of digest them, and the hairs actually lie in the stomach of a cuckoo. So if you find a dead cuckoo and you dissect it, you find inside the stomach all of these hairs, and there's no other bird that we know of that's able to do that. It's amazing that everything out here can be something to eat for something else which likes to eat it. Now we're driving vaguely in the direction of, oh no, we're not vaguely in the direction of Scott, we're driving pretty much exactly towards Scott as we speak. There he is. Oh. And um, some fork-tailed drongos just, just flew over here. Yeah, it's there behind us. Okay, let's go forward now. There is Scott. We had to quickly swing the camera away because he was doing something nefarious. We'll blame him for that. What Hi. Can't do so long there? Sleeping on the back. I don't know. I think he is just. <laughs> He's just, uh, he's just snoozing on the back here. Hello, Nicola. How's your back? No, full of joy. Packed full of mammals. Yeah. Eh? Yes. Packed. Yeah, yes. all over. Some kind of a record, possibly. I think it might be a record. This might be the largest group of mammals ever seen on a drive. Ten out of ten we're going to get. more than we have. Well, you know, it's my age. On the count of my advanced age. And wisdom. Well... I didn't want to say anything, but yes, probably. <laughs> OK, James, well, we're going to leave you be. Dog tracks go. They were going towards Shabam, close Shabam. to the end of Treehouse, and then we just... Right, okay. right we're yeah. going to send you to sit next to Nikki there. Move up. <laughs> That's it. OK. All right. Go and join her, and we'll see you shortly. Bye-bye. Well, always pleasant bumping into the other crew. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. James and I have been through default crossing one another's paths quite often recently. I am secretly just following his moves, hoping that I'm going to be able to feed off his sightings like a remora feeds off the food that a shark feeds on. I'm remoraring. Remoraring, James. Ah, I wonder what's for breakfast. I'm getting hungry. Sure, well... Shelly in Florida. You are inquiring about six toad cats. Never heard of a six toed cat. I've only heard of the four toed cats that we see. They do have a dew claw, which would have been essentially a thumb, but it's become a vestigial limb, so it doesn't really do anything. Um, so that would be the fifth toe, I guess, but we don't see that in their tracks up there. Are any cats with six toes out there? I would suggest probably getting it amputated. It's not normal. Only kidding, that's just that I, you know, I don't know anything about six toed cats. But if anybody can furnish us with anything that they do know about these cats, unless of, of course, deformities, that would be great. in Connecticut. I hope all is well. You are inquiring about the tiny little bird it's called blue waxbills that I've discussed in the past and I'm wondering if we found any of their nests that they have their private security systems around being wasp nests so the bird will build its nest just above the 
highly aggressive vespid wasps nest and the knowledge that those wasps will sting and attack any animals that are trying to raid the nest and sadly no i have not seen any of these nests this season but the birds no they are not migratory they are here we do see them but they're very small and small birds are difficult for us to show you so we just have to wait for the opportune moments to try and get those on camera it wasn't i think it was yesterday or the day before that we did see a couple um, so they are here, it's just we've been unfortunate finding their nests. Which is surprising because it technically should be easier to find birds' nests now when the vegetation is sparse than when it's thick. And obviously you can see a clump in bushes. They usually don't nest very high up off the ground, the wax balls. They're usually quite easy nests to find. There goes some impala for my boys. in Maryland, you have informed us that cats with six toes are called polydactyl cats and you've had two of these, but I mean, is this normal or is this a strange deformity? I don't know. Very interesting though, thank you for that. Here we have got the two-toed warthog. Little piglets, cute, and a mum. There's a couple around, but not the easiest. Oh, there's another. And that looks like it's in a slightly better spot. Looks like four little piggies and two slightly bigger ones. One of which will probably be an older brother or sister from last year's litter. And then the other one, the larger one, it's mom. It looks like they are going to catch up to mom now. There's mom over there. Oh, love it when they run. They erect their tails. Very characteristic of warthogs running. Both adults and young will do that. A great follow me signal. Being very short, it's useful to have an antenna from which to follow as they flee through the bush. Sure, well, it really is heating up now that we've stopped the vehicle. Bye bye, what is? It looks kind of like it's going to be a typical hot and humid summer day here in the low fault. It's been quite nice and cool up until now, though. So we've been lucky over the last few days with some much cooler weather. But I think this afternoon we are going to be melting, unless we get some clouds coming in, but it's looking like clear skies all around. That, of course, can change. A typical summer here is really wonderful with the amount of cloud formations and thunderstorms and the speed at which they can build up. But we'll have to wait for next summer, hopefully for that, when there's no drought and full swing. Hello, Bud, in Canada, you would like to know if it would be possible to get a visual tour, tour, sorry, not Canada, Carolina of our camp that we stay in and the final control room. But what I'll do is I'll do a video as soon as we get back now and I'll post it on my Scott Dyson Safari's Facebook page and I'll take you on a tour of the camp and exactly what's going on. You'll even maybe get to meet Salty Frank, our chef. He should be baking some muffins this morning. Um, it's our muffin day, muffins and fruits. Anyway, you'll see. And in the next few minutes, check out my page. It may take a while to upload because we've got very slow internet out here. Um, anyway, I'll do that for you now. The final control room video I will do at a later stage. Or maybe I'll get Mickey to do that. Guys, thanks so much for a wonderful morning. It's been great fun. Well done, Louise, for directing. And Leanne for lending her hand. I think, I think Kirsty as well. Dave, thanks for your great camera work. James and Jean-Dre say goodbye, and so do we. We will see you all on the Sunset Safari.